Yes, what a wonderful way to start our sunset safari. As you can see, we've got this most cutest of the cuteness of uh, animals that's sitting right on top of a termite mound. It is a little dwarf mongoose and he is absolutely enjoying this afternoon as there is finally no rain here at the Juma Private Game Reserve and it just seems like it's going to be a fantastic afternoon. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera here on Wendy we've got the one and only, once again, Panda. So yes, thanks for joining us this afternoon and well I think it is going to be wonderful as I said, it looks like a lovely lovely day, the afternoon, seems like there's a bit of blue skies that's coming through and of course we've got our beautiful dwarf mongoose that's just enjoying the afternoon uh, heat and a little bit of warmth as well as this morning we had quite a bit of rain that came through this area and um, it looks like it has subsided for now uh, there's still a prediction of a bit of rain for later on but for now I think everything is going to be enjoying the afternoon sunlight or a little bit of heat around you and especially these dwarf mongoose they are so cute I love just sitting here and spending some time with these little animals and just to see the little bit of an interaction between the family members and uh, oh, it is, they are very good. I think Lauren had some uh, little ones, I think it was this morning or yesterday, I can't remember, but she had uh, youngsters as well around some of these uh, tournament mounts. So, so, so beautiful. Well, yes, definitely, I'm also rearing for the sunset safari. Definitely, uh, my tail is up and I am really keen to get out here and take a look what we can find for everybody but as you can see this is a live this is an interactive show so if you've got any comments and questions or suggestions that you want to send through to us please do so of course all of us we are waiting for those questions and i'm hoping that we can answer as much as possible but yes on this afternoon's drive on rusty we've got the lauren and darby and up there in pridelands chris and owen all the way up in the northwest, Ben and Eagle, and down in the Eastern Cape in Kariha, we've got our Nick. So yes, we are, I'm sure we're all definitely waiting to get out here and see what we can find for everybody this afternoon. But on top of that, I am enjoying these dwarf mongoose. As you can see, they're using one of the termite mounds here on quarantine. It's a big open clearing that's just south of our camp, and they're using it as a den site. So they'll usually, all the whole family will pretty much live around inside of this uh, termite mound. And then they will, during the daytime, of course, warm up. And then they'll go and forage for some insects. They are insectivorous, so they mainly feed on insects. So you're looking at like grasshoppers, crickets, little grubs, beetles. And on top of that as well, I've seen, seen it before on, uh, I think it was a video that was posted with uh, these little dwarf mongoose actually attacking a baby scrubby so it just shows you they're little they're small but they are quite vicious and definitely and it's the same pretty much the same kind of social structure as the wild dogs you'll see that it's also controlled by an alpha male and alpha female in this little pack they are so cute look at it <laughs> he's just looking out and i'm sure the others are busy foraging around the termite mounds and you'll find one or two that's kind of elevated and like a kind of a, a lookout for the rest but yeah while we are going to sit here with these dwarf mongoose let's take a look what the weather is like this afternoon <laughs> Good afternoon from Kariha Game Reserve. Like you've seen there, it is a little bit cooler, a little bit rainy here today. My name is Nick and I'm going to be your photo naturalist for today. Definitely slightly gloomier conditions today. We have had quite a bit of rain throughout the day. But luckily for us it has held off for the moment now. Oh, a little bit of cheekiness going on from the zebra here. That's obviously the spot that that mare wanted, <laughs> chasing the other one off. 
So we have started our afternoon on the clearings here close to Scotia Dam, which is just further behind us. And we've started with some cheeky zebra. That was a little bit of an unexpected kick. I feel like that female walked over there and just asserted the the fact that she wanted that spot and that other one was move now. No such thing as cutting a little bit of slack in the zebra world apparently. That was more of just like a, a gentle reminder but they are very powerful animals. Sally, hey, thanks for the comment. I'm so glad that you're enjoying Karicha. Yeah, it is, a, it is really a little gem. You know, in terms of the variety of, of sightings that we've got here, the scenery here is very unique. You know, it's, it's very different to the low felt, very different to Okokuyo. So I'm glad that you're enjoying it as much as I am. So I think collectively now from last night to where we are now, we must be approaching 30 mils of rain, I'd say. If you were able to join us during our escape to nature, you would have seen we did have some strong rains. Beautiful to get up close and personal with the zebra here. Look how narrow that little foal stripes are around its face and on its neck compared to mom's. Mom's stripes are much thicker, much broader. Oh, everything is peaceful with this one passing in front. Alright, well we're going to leave a peaceful scene with our zebras here and take you across to Lauren and Juma to say afternoon. Good afternoon everyone. I can honestly say in all my career at Wild Earth, I have never started the drive with fish. Just give it a moment or two. I can introduce myself in a second. They have been coming out the water. It's the catfish, huge catfish, inside one of our water bodies. Amazing, <laughs> which is called Gowrie Dam. And they're not always visible, but they, they are coming out of the water. I'm not sure why yet. And you can actually see their entire body, the size of them, the fins. Unbelievable. So now I can officially say I have started a drive in the low felt with fish. Good afternoon, my name is Lauren Darby is with me on camera and this is incredible. As many of you know, I am a marine biologist by degree. So talking about fish again gets me really excited. Oh, there's one, look. That's it, Dove. Unbelievable. Now catfish are normally bottom feeders. They're called catfish because they've got like those really long cat-like whiskers that come from the mouth, but they're not whiskers at all and they're really nothing like a cat's, but that's where the name comes from. They are in fact barbels and they're sensory barbels. So the top sense for a catfish it's not vision it's not hearing it's not chemicals well it is chemicals but they're using their barbels to detect them that's their primary sense if you are a catfish so they use these barbels they have control over them and they're actually able to use them oh hello gray heron are you also coming to join the fish party because we know you like fish 
They use the sensory barbels to actually dig in the ground, they're bottom feeders. They're omnivores, so they're able to sort of dig and feel and sense for the food. Kimberly, I know, right? It's so cool to see them. We talk about them. We very often say, ah, oh, there are catfish in this dam, or there are sort of different, the tilapias are in this dam, but we never see them. The only one time I have seen the fish here is when there was a mass fish die-off in Chitwa. And this was due to hypoxia, which would come about by low water levels and far too many hippos. Hippos doing a lot of defecating and causing excess nutrients and bacteria. So it dropped the oxygen levels, which meant the fish, well, they suffocated actually, and they ended up drowning. <laughs> Dobby, there's your favorite bird. Dobby loves this bird. Hi, Hadi Raz. Yes, you are on camera now. I'll stop talking about the fish. Are you happy? I think that means they're happy. They are very loud birds. <laughs> Can't remember what I was saying now. What was I saying? Yes, so the fish suffocated and of course they washed ashore. They were all on the banks of the water. water body <laughs> called Chitwa and lots of predators came down to feast leopards, we had hyenas, we had lions <laughs> and that's the only time I've seen fish but sadly they were dead so this is just remarkable and I mean the catfish will feed on mollusks, small fish, insects in the water crustaceans, larvae, even plants, they are omnivorous, so they could be feeding right now. But this is fascinating. I think I'm going to sit and watch them a little bit longer. Wild Earth is looking for unique wildlife sightings filmed by you. They can be old or new from anywhere in the world and filmed on a camera or on your phone. In return, we will give you cash, an opportunity to win a prize and a chance to see your clip on TV with your name in the credits. It's easy. Head over to wildearth.tv forward slash content to find out more.
come across back to me here at Kuricha at the most inopportune time for this little zebra fall. <laughs> no such thing as privacy for him. He's even got a bliss book right behind him there. No time like the present, I guess. He's got his New Year's resolution straight and he's going to do whatever tickles his taste buds. Oh, lovely little tender moment here. So it was such interesting behavior to watch how this female walked over and chased that other zebra away. And then after that, how there's been actually quite a lot of, of sort of gentle body contact between this mare and that other zebra, which I think was also a mare, but sort of quite friendly, quite playful almost. Maybe this mare was just kind of just instigating the fact that its foal was here not to cause any any problems. Everybody's playing follow the leader here. Jackets generally sort of uh, a few years, you know, closer to sort of three years or so, zebra starting to get a little older. You're not necessarily going to find just a group of, of male zebra, it's not as common. Remember, sort of a bachelor group with your impalas, it's not really a stock standard as that, but generally, with it'll be a few years. Not too sure what this youngster is up to here. It was potentially looking to suckle. Remember for zebras they suckle from the side. So I don't know if he was just looking for a bit of body contact from mum there. In terms of your, your species that will suckle from behind the mother, that'll be your buffalo. That's the most commonly uh, commonly known one to suckle from, from behind the mother. That is the suckling position. It's amazing when you go through all the different species, different suckling positions. You know, the the elephant calves, they'll suckle from from the front. The teat of the mother is just behind the front leg. It's so different for a lot of different species here. It's such a nice, peaceful afternoon here at Kariha. Like I said, the rain has temporarily stopped for us. There are one or two book dotted around the clearings here. Hoping that we might get that big journey of giraffe that we saw temporarily this morning, but from quite a distance. It'd be nice if they decided to come and say hi for us. Like I said, we have started the afternoon here at Scotia Dam. Maybe I'll take a trundle down to the water itself. I have heard some South African shell ducks calling, and I know we haven't seen them in quite a while, so it might be nice to see if we can get a good view of them. There is a single baboon calling far in the distance behind me. Just one. It's not like it's a whole group of them that kind of tells us that something may be there. I think maybe that one that is calling is just having a bad day or he's just not enjoying something in particular. So I'm going to stick around with these zebra for a little longer, just see how everything progresses with them. And in the meantime, we're going to take you across to Lauren and see what a catfish are up to.
we have just witnessed the most incredible thing. First, I want to give you some context. We're still... <gasps> There's one out of the water, Dove. There, on the barbed wire. Oh, no. Get back in the water. <gasps> It's not barbed wire, sorry, I don't know why I said that. The boulder wire. That's 100% a catfish. I don't know if you saw the barbels coming out the mouth. Did it get back in? I think so. Ah, there he is, he's coming upstream now. This is amazing. All the catfish seem to have left the dam. He's here, Dobby. And the... They seem to have been swept downstream. This is the overflow of the dam that's starting the Mulawati, what we call the Mulawati here. And I think he's there. I think he's about to make this leap. We just watched one leap like they're in sort of a, a video game and they're all trying to get back upstream. And this is very small for us. I mean, this is a puddle for us, but to a fish, this current, this torrent of water that's going downstream must be really, he's there, Darby, really difficult to swim against. More, 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 there you go. And fish can't breathe outside water. Most of them, okay, some of them can, some catfish can, but generally speaking, they do need, their gills extract oxygen from the water. Patrick, yes, I guess so. It's not really walking like us, you or I, but they are able to use their pectoral fins, the fins at the bottom. They're very, very strong and they are able to use them to haul their bodies across land. They can survive in very low oxygen, almost hypoxic or temporary sort of anoxic conditions. And they're able to Sorry, I just can't take my eyes off this. This is crazy. They're all struggling to get back upstream. And they're able to use their gills to sort of draw whatever oxygen may be there. And they're able to move from water point to water point using those really strong pectoral fins. Isn't this just amazing? I've never seen that happen before here. They are remarkable fish, they're very big, but their sensory world is just so equipped for what they do. These barbels are really powerful for them and they contain so many sensors and that's how they navigate, that's how they find their food. And this is a lot of water. The Mowati, our river, is normally dry. It's now completely flowing and this is all the water that's leaving the dam. And just in fish, the tail fin is your caudal fin. You've got the anal fin towards the back of the body. And then underneath, if you think of fish, you sort of have these fins underneath. These are the pectoral fins. And this is the one that the catfish use to walk. This is how they walk. And then on top, you have the dorsal fin. So you have caudal, anal, pectoral, dorsal. That could be a dance. I feel like that could go places. Maybe we should talk to Cedric about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see any more. Sorry, I missed that name, but yes, it is wonderful to see so much water in the water bodies. I mean, this is overflowing. This is water everywhere. And then if we go on to have some really hot days, it will dry up. Picky! Sorry, I was too busy doing my fish fins explanation. Picky, it is so wonderful. And I know many of you wanted to see this, but this is coming from the water body that's the closest to where we live, and it is called Gallery Dam. It's just completely overflowing. And I've never seen a catfish come out like that before. And the predators will snack on them. I think Cedric had Clalamba trying to get one the other day. They're delicious. Fish are full of meat, full of protein, and the predators, if they can, absolutely will try and get some catfish. But I feel like they've all managed to get upstream now.
Yeah, I think they have. I can see them all. And that was what was causing the ripples at the dam the other day. I couldn't quite pinpoint what was causing those ripples. Ah, what a wonderful start to the sunset safari. So everybody's getting up to a bit of afternoon feeding here at Kariha. You can see directly behind the zebra on the left. Sort of 50 meters. Let me focus there. You can see there are quite a few hardy dars at the back there. And they've kind of been flitting around and they've been doing some feeding of their own. Similar to the zebra. Good for them, you know. They're taking advantage of the nice soft soils from all of the rain. I'm keeping an eye out for any yellow-billed kites. So I haven't seen our buffalo down here close to Scotia Dam in quite a while. And remember, especially in conditions when we've got big animals like buffalo moving around, we quite often see some of the birds and yellow bull kites and ox pickers and things like that moving around looking to see if they can potentially get any any little insects and things like that so we, like I was saying I haven't had those buffalo here but kind of half expecting just to or more more kind of hopeful in terms of looking for behavior of any yellow bull kites or anything like that looking to to use these zebra to kind of flush out any of the insects obviously with the t with the, the the weather that we've had you know this it's going to draw a lot of these insects out so there is a potential chance we might start to see that I did see some tracks of a it looked like a good sized herd of buffalo further to the south of where we are here and they did seem pretty fresh remember we've had rain throughout the day so potentially the, that herd of buffalo might not be too far away, but it would be lovely if they did come into the area here. Remember, some of the mud wallows have now filled up with water. It's definitely not an extremely hot day at all here today at Kariha. But coming up into the next day or two, we might see those buffaloes coming to make use of these little mud wallows. I'm on the southern side of uh, our property and if you were watching this morning at, uh, on our sunrise safari I found that uh, male lion right at the end of our drive and uh, it was definitely one of the black dam males so it's a new male uh, lion coalition that's been hanging around here on the northern Sabi sands for the last uh, month or two but yep yeah, I've got you perfectly in the sand exactly where they crossed over from uh, last night and you can see how big this track is of this male line. So you can see typical with the three lobes of a cat. One, two, three. And of course the three pugs there. And of course uh, the other foot, the back foot, has come here with the four pugs here. So of course the front foot, foot and the back foot. Now look how big this line track. I mean it's almost the size of my hand. No, it's actually the size of my hand, really. It's actually the size of my hand. That is enormous. And that's the front, uh, the front foot, of course. And uh, heading straight north, straight up a road called Shabamu. So they head up to, the, most probably that's where they were heading up this side, heading north, most probably calling. And that's how we got all that audio from lions this morning. There was plenty of audio around, or calling of my lions around uh, uh, our camp area. And then we got more lions calling a little bit further south again towards Treehouse Dam, right at the end of uh, drive. And of course we're going to go and follow up and we found that male lion lying close to the dam itself. So I might just go turn around, head up into that area very slowly and just to see if we can pick up on any of the uh, tracks from this afternoon. But I, I don't think they've moved much. I mean there's so much water all around and I think they will be most probably resting somewhere close to that drainage line. Uh, that's north of the dam itself but yeah it is just really huge it's it's gigantic tracks i mean a leopard is much smaller half the side 
Uh, Christine, it's difficult uh, after, look, if it's just rained and then you've got tracks, then you know those tracks are going to be very fresh. That's a difference. I mean, Christine, that's a big difference. So, in other words, if we had like this morning, we had a lot of rain, and if you see tracks that's on top of the rain, then you know it's fresh. Then, you, then you're then definitely going to try and follow up as quick as possible. Uh, the problem with the rain as well, if there was lines maybe an hour, two hours prior to the time of the rain, and then all of a sudden those tracks are washed away, and we won't be able to uh, track them down then. Then it becomes quite difficult. So it is, it's a it's a win-win situation in certain ways, but as well as it does make things a little bit difficult. All right, I'm just going to move out the way. I am on a service road, so I don't want this uh, vehicle to drive over me here. Uh, I'll just wait for him to go past. Uh, do apologize about that. The, it is one of the, as I said, it, it is a service road, and the guy was just uh, giving me some kind of a, a hooter there. Anyway, I think he was just telling me to get off the road. All right, <laughs> let's uh, let me rather move off from here and head back into Juma. Let's head back in north where the line tracks are okay. going. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's probably the guy was saying, like, you silly Billy. So, yeah. Uh, Jerry, I know that they have been chasing Mohawk, so that of course is the last Avoca male line that's controlling the northern sands, the northern Sobby sand. Um, so we have had uh, those two males chasing them very close proximity to that uh, single male. Um, as well as after that they've been calling, they've been scent marking, they've been very, um, they've been very vocal. Those males have been very vocal, so in other words they are definitely uh, announcing their presence. It's not like they're coming through here silent and, and uh, not, uh, not wanting any other lions to know that they are around. They're coming here showing their presence, send marking and uh, that is a clear sign that they are here to, to stay, here to take over territory and that's why there's a lot of, a lot of shift with uh, female prides. So a lot of prides are busy shifting their territories at the moment I and mean, we've got the Mbali's yeah, on the northern uh, area as well. I think Lauren had the two Mbali females from a pride that's, I never knew that that would go all the way towards uh, Boabab Dam. So it just shows you. <sighs> Lion dynamics at the moment, it takes time. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a chess game. Um, it takes a lot of time. Each one is, you know, kind of marking their position on what is going to be the best for that pride or that coalition. and. Um, so that's exactly what's happened and it's amazing it just takes two males new males in the area to change this entire system up just two males it's like just like that and it changes it changes a lot around here so they are around here so they're just to the way east of me so where i'm now they're just to the east of me they're in this drainage line it's no ways because it's um, there's so much rain the ground has been saturated and um, so we don't we're not going to go off-roading unfortunately uh, for now we don't want to do damage to the ground but i'm hoping maybe later on if, I, if they're not around here where we can see them maybe later on or we'll come back into this area and hopefully we do get them maybe on the open clearing towards the dam so Quite, quite crazy. The line dynamics are quite crazy. The ones, the cubs and the sub adults that do not belong to these uh, new males, because they are the ones that's uh, under uh, the most uh, threat and uh, danger. Good afternoon everybody. Sorry about that. The weather is making it a little bit tricky today. But as you can see, the weather in Okokuyo is just picture perfect. And believe it or not, I saw an Oryx today. You're probably thinking, you silly girl, they live here, of course. <laughs> we have not seen Oryx in weeks. So I was super thrilled about that. But if you're wondering who is this random person, my name is Lisa. I'm the water hole naturalist, keeping an eye on the Juma Dam Cam as well as Ukokuyo. And of course, keeping all of you informed if we see anything. 
We've had some springbok today, impalas, wildebeest, zebras, and as I say, two oryxes to our knowledge. <laughs> so it definitely has been a beautiful day. But this morning I actually made mention of the fact that it is super sunny, but I really do hope we get some heavy clouds this afternoon pulling in. This is not so promising yet, but hopefully it darkens and we'll get a proper storm again here in Ukukweo. Alrighty, well as always I will keep you updated if I see anything, but for now I'm going to send you to Nick and Karega. Okay, so we've started to shift a little bit closer to Scotia Dam. The zebras are not too far away. And I've been stopped in my tracks before I've got there. So that is Scotia Dam in the background that we can see. And we've got a lovely view of a sacred arbus here. Looks like he's doing just a little bit of cleaning. He has been kind of moving around, doing a bit of probing. These ibis are so often moving around that it's so nice to get him standing still and actually be able to have a good look at him at his sort of his body composition. So you can see he's a very similar shaped bird to the hardy dog. Remember they are part of the same family, the ibis family, sacred ibis and hardy dog ibis. I feel like the, the beak of a sacred ibis a little bit longer potentially than that of a hardy dog arbus. You can see when he does stop preening and you get a good look at the length of that beak. We were talking about the rain softening the ground up, the ground up, and you can see how good of a tool, how good of a utensil that'll be to be able to probe down into the ground and look for some little morsels to eat. It's amazing how clean he still is after all of the rain that we've had as well. Maria, thanks for the question. Uh, so a sacred ibis in terms of, of calls and vocalizations, it's generally more of a silent type of bird. It's not like it's chatting all the time when the sun comes up or after a rain. You know, you look at certain birds like your taracos and uh, book Macaries and Cape Long Claws and things, they will be calling specifically after the rain like this. Whereas the Sacred Ibis, he doesn't really do that. So calls are, are a little bit rarer to hear, but when they do call, it's more of a, it's more of like a, it's, it's, it's a mixture between almost like a croak and a squeal. Um, it's a very strange, it's, I would say it's usually quite a harsh sounding call, it's not a beautiful call. You know, some birds you think of a, black-headed oriole. It's quite a, quite a fluid, almost like a melody to it. It's a beautiful type of call. Whereas a, a sacred ibis, that's definitely not a strong point. <laughs> uh, it's better if he just doesn't call at all. So if you've heard a grey heron calling, which is quite a, a harsh call, we, uh, uh, Lauren had a grey heron flying around there earlier. Call, but if you've ever heard a grey heron call, it's a very harsh type of call. The sacred ibis is not too dissimilar from that. Shame, the sacred ibis is getting a little bit of a, the raw end of the deal. You know, he's certainly not gonna win any safari bowl prize for good looks you compare him to Narina Trogan or something like that and we're giving him a tough time about his call as well. In a world full of upheaval, we all need a quiet and safe place. 
place where anxiety and stress don't exist. A place where life carries on. Slip away into a brand new show exclusively on Wild Earth. Just Nature. Just got an African Harrier Hawk. It's just flying westward like the same one as yesterday, a juvenile. Now don't go away. Ah, come back. Okay, it's flying back. It's turning around. Uh, oh, I don't know. It looks like this uh, African Harrier Hawk. The same exactly at Trials Dam as well. We saw that uh, juvenile that was busy hunting uh, in some of the dead trees and inside of the nest. But unfortunately, it might turn for us. What do you think, Panda? It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Maybe it'll land in one of these dead trees for us. Yes, there it is. Oh, oh, it's going to go a little bit further. So a beautiful bird of prey. So of course, uh, this African Harrier Hawk there will go and try and feed on a lot of the little, maybe squirrels and uh, chicks or bird chicks and uh, inside of these hollowed out trees. And that's nice. And this juvenile is, unfortunately, you can just see the silhouette at the moment. The light is not that great. But uh, they usually are quite pretty. It's a beautiful grey colour, like this real soft grey um, to them. And then, of course, like this black tips on the you know, tips of their feathers, or their primary feathers. And then they've got these beautiful white, I mean, white, yellow faces. I'm hoping that this uh, African Harrier Hawk will decide to go and hunt like yesterday. He was definitely, or she was definitely performing for us around the Atrias Dam. But yeah, well, we are going to sit and see what this African Harrier Hawk does. Let's head over to Ben in Madikwe to see what's happening up there in the northwest. Good afternoon everybody. Well the rain has not quite cleared, it's still drizzling, but that has not dampened our spirits at all because look what we have literally just found. We have found seven wild dogs trotting up the road. This is the last one that's about to go past us and then we will have to turn around for you. But what an amazing way to start the afternoon with dogs. So it looks like seven in the pack uh, from what I could see. First time that uh, I've seen these dogs. We saw a pack of four last week, uh, but there are seven here. So Madikwe well known for its dogs, but very, very cool. Look like they've got some full bellies, but on the move in this sort of cool, drizzly weather. 
as you would expect. They've just gone behind the car. Are you happy there, Igor, or should we quickly turn around? Okay. Thank you, Adam. What a great start indeed. Hello, everybody. I'm Ben on camera. It's Igor. Excuse me. I've got to quickly turn the car around and let's keep a view of these dogs. Yeah, not a bad way to start the afternoon because it's been, we've had really heavy rains. We had a thunderstorm this afternoon. We weren't even sure if we were going to be able to come out. Um, and then these dogs apparently were seen this morning up in this area and we took a bit of a gamble as to which road to take and evidently we gambled right. Might have to go to the casino at some point uh, over the next couple of days. Apparently we're having some good luck. Well, what a treat. All right, let's see if we can get you another view. Spectacular. Again, sorry for the post, everybody. We're gonna to have to continuously keep repositioning but we're very grateful for the roof today I'm just zipping my jacket up so the rain is falling a little bit heavier now apparently it's a bluting time I think they've probably slept some of the day away everybody is uh, seeming to have the same idea at the moment but they do look as if they've got relatively full bellies remember these are very very successful hunters for a pack of seven, not a problem to take out two Impala a day, if not three. Oh. Sorry, Gwen, your question broke up there. Can you repeat it for me, please? Uh, Christine, I'm not sure. I mean, not individually. I'm sure they know the individual packs, but I know from speaking to the other guys, they've had a lot of different changes of dynamics where ones have split from other ones and they've had a little bit of immigration and emigration at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. I don't think they name them as such, uh, but they know they did have a pack of, well, they've got a pack of seven, a pack of four. Uh, I th think the four used to be more, but some have split away and formed their own pack. I'm not 100% sure how many dogs are actually on the reserve here at the moment. Um, so I think really they're sort of based on numbers, but I'm sure there is an ID kit for the guys doing research. But from the guide's perspective, uh, certainly I don't know of any of the packs that have got names per se. Okay, they are on the move again. Let's see if we can keep up with them. But of course it is easy to recognize individual dogs. All those markings are unique. I uh, haven't even got it, too excited to even look at the different sexes. I'm not sure what the boys and girls situation is. Uh, obviously, the roads are quite wet. We were driving up a road earlier, and it was just two channels of water. Uh, it's been rain all over the country today. So I'm not sure how flexible we're going to be able to be in terms of following them if they leave the road. They have gone off to the right. We've still got distance of one, distance couple there but there is a road we can take up to the right here so we should be okay for now but what an amazing start to the afternoon we were so lucky with dogs I saw quite a few different packs uh, in Juma but this is my first personal wild dogs Waikisha doggies indeed hey yeah? very exciting okay there's another vehicle here who has gone off the road so we will follow his vehicle tracks in Gobby, thank you. Yeah, he's just said we can go here because there's decent grass coverage. Be invited to be a bit careful because we have had a lot of rain. See, uh, a lot of rain in certain areas and then not so much in others. Here is not as bad as south where we were. There was some very, very heavy rain. Uh, some of the road had been washed away. Believe it or not, we are back on a road now. <laughs> so we, we could be here. Get them crossing in a second. Yeah. 
Okay, there we go. Hopefully you can see them in front of us. Oh. Picking up the pace a little bit. I don't know if they've seen something. Say any of you who have watched this before or know anything about the journey, they are constantly on the move. But let's send you back over to Cedric while we try and find where these dogs are off to. Nice Ben, you've got some wild dogs in my dick way, fantastic. That's uh that is definitely a good start for you that side. But yes, I'm still here at a treehouse dam and I am still watching this African harrier hawk that's just at the lower branches. You can just see the big bird of prey on the bottom left hand branch just sitting there. And you've got the two virtual starlings that's sitting right on top. And now and again, if, uh, as soon as this African harrier hawk moves towards one of the branches, I think closer to their nesting site, these uh, virtual starlings are like dive bombing this uh, this bird of prey. But he looks like is he in, has he got something there? It looks like something white. Looks like he's looking at something, or is he feeding on something there? It is quite far for us at the moment. Unfortunately, it's on the other side of the dam. It looks like there's something white in front of him. Just want to double check on that. Yeah, it might actually have a little chick there. And that's why they're not too happy. Or is this a reflection? No, it's just a reflection off the branch. Just wanted to say. Oh, 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 oh. He went down for something now in the grass. So maybe like a mouse. So of course, some mice is also a big part of their diet. Mice, or any kind of rodents, so mice, gerbils, rats, um, even the dwarf mongoose. And dwarf mongoose have to also really keep a lookout for these birds of prey because they are formidable hunters. I mean, they've got these long legs, and it's the only bird that actually has got a double jointed knee, so they can actually kind of uh, push their leg backwards instead of always forward. So it's kind of getting to the crevices and the holes. And grabbing any little chick that's sitting inside of those dead trees. He's gone in there now. Difficult to see what he's picked up on. But look at that little stream that's coming down. It's amazing. The water is flowing and it's all coming in towards the treehouse dam, which is uh, quite full at the moment. Or well, very full. And the sun is coming out. Definitely a pleasant afternoon. Even that light, even the sun is reflecting nicely off that water on those little streams. And eh? mm, very, very nice. We can see how brown the water is. I can imagine all that mud that's been brought down the stream that's into the dam. Yeah, Julie, that's exactly. So that's what they that's what they built for, uh, Julie. They are specialised for feeding on chicks that's in nests. That's like they, that's a, that that's their main target. So you'll find something like these uh, red billed uh, um, uh, weavers, oh, red billed red billed buffalo weavers, that make these big nests. You'll see those big nests on the one side of the tree, the dead tree. There's a big big nest in It's called red billed buffalo weaver. There, there is on that one there. And uh, you'll see those ones. So that's uh, perfect for many a time you see those African Harrier walks. They'll actually go and put their talents inside there and try and grab those chicks out. But why the red billed buffalo weaver is very clever on top of that as well now. For their protection from that kind of predator and from that bird of prey, 
what they do, they will build in nests from thorn, uh, uh, thorn, uh, thorn trees, so all the branches from a thorn tree. So all those little branches that's pretty much situated around that nest now is from, of course, something like your, uh, your knob thorns, uh, black monkey thorn, um, all the acacia thorns and of course or acacia trees and of course what they do then they'll kind of pack it around there and hopefully it will kind of uh, deter and prevent that uh, bird of prey from actually getting close into that nest but I've seen it before the hanging upside down the African hairy hawk hangs upside down and still manages to grab those chicks out of those nests so yeah that's their main diet is chicks and those are squirrels so squirrels they got the thing called a tray so a dray is a, a, a home for a squirrel and in that dray you'll find like in the hollowed out trees they'll have their little ones inside there and of course these birds of prey will go straight uh, for those little holes and try and grab those little ones out. Very clever, very well built for these kind of situations. And yesterday we got to see that uh, African Harry walk, same one, must be the same one. Also the juvenile that's hanging around at this dam actually hanging upside down at one of the trees around here. And there's been a lot of catfish at the inflows and the outflows of these dams. I think Lauren got some catfish as well at Gurry Dam. All right, well, we are going to move away from uh, Trias Dam and go and look to see what else we can find. Let's head back to Madikwe as Ben is still running with his wild dogs. Yes, welcome back, everybody. Well, we've had a brief, brief respite. Uh, the dogs seem to have just laid up now. Uh, under these acacias, maybe getting out of the rain, but off to my left, or in sort of in the direction that that dog is looking, is a herd of impala. Uh, I'm not sure if the dogs are aware of the impala yet, or vice versa. Oop. Uh, sorry, one of the vehicles just uh, um, moving past us there. Let me just move forward a touch, and we will... Oh, where's he going to go? I'm just going to move forward. Okay, so we've got a couple here and a couple a little further back. Uh, sorry, so as I was saying, so there are some impala off to our left, but I'm not sure if the dogs are aware of them yet or if they've seen them. They're probably about 150 metres off, but it's quite open here. So maybe we are lucky and we see a hunt, but they do have quite full bellies at the moment. Uh, remember with dogs, if they are running, and especially if they've eaten recently, whilst they're running, they don't really start the digestive process. Uh, that's one of those adaptations to be able to carry food back to youngsters or sick ones who are perhaps uh, weren't able to be a part of the hunt, particularly if there are youngsters in a den somewhere. I have no idea if there are any pups. I haven't heard anything about wild dog puppies on Madikwe yet. Um, but obviously that ability to regurgitate food would not work once the digestive process has started. So they have that ability to sort of keep the food in the stomach until they sit down and relax and let the stomach do its thing. So they're still quite full at the moment. So I would imagine they've eaten in the last hour or two. But dogs are dogs. So we will cross our fingers and see whether or not they show any interest. <laughs> uh, honey badger, I think they are just a little bit dirty from the mud and also from the rain. Remember when the rain sort of saturates all the skin uh, and makes it look a little bit darker than the animals actually are. But uh, beautiful coats, also known of course as the painted wolf, as their Latin name suggests, Lysenon pictus, basically means painted wolf. And those beautiful sort of patchwork quilts of browns and whites and tawny colours and blacks. Beautiful, beautiful creatures. Yep, 
You see, this one is collared, so, so there is uh, various research that is being done here, like there are in many parks. So this one is obviously the collared member of the pack, but quite who has access to that, I'm not sure. Certainly not us as guides or lodgers. It'll be purely for the research team for the Northwest Parks Board, who ultimately run a very tight ship up here, and they do an excellent job. Um, dark mane lover, uh, they're generally pretty tolerant, they'll probably move away, they may even be curious. I've bumped into dogs a few times on foot and have never had a problem, they kind of watch you or just trot away into the distance. Um, and I've never heard of dogs attacking people, so yeah, I would, you don't have to be quite so wary of them, but they are still wild animals. Um, so certainly are deserving of our respect, but um, I would say they're not as an immediate danger of a lot of the other things that you could encounter out here. Uh, so I remember encountering some on foot. Actually, we actually found these sort of on foot um, today. Uh, just before you came there, we'd actually got out of the vehicle because we'd seen fresh tracks on the road going in both directions, and we were both uh, out, Igor and myself, just looking to see whether or not, uh, or which direction they were going, and we managed to find one track overlapping another track, showing which one was fresher. Um, and we walked about probably only 30 metres down the road and we saw them trotting towards us. Uh, and so they were completely indifferent to us, but obviously it depends how relaxed they are with people. Uh, but it's very difficult to track dogs on foot because they move so quickly. If they're on the move, you'll, you will not catch up with them, quite simply. Uh, it's easier to sort of do laps in the vehicles um, and check each block or each road and see if there are any tracks crossing. But yeah, I've not heard of any issues of wild dogs attacking people. I'm sure they probably have been, but uh, none to my knowledge. But say, don't underestimate dogs. There was actually a story in the papers the other day. It was actually in England, I believe, because I was over in England a couple of weeks ago going to see family and friends and read it in the newspaper that a woman was walking seven dogs and something happened to them and pack mentality sort of set in and they actually attacked her um, and did her quite a lot of damage uh, unexpectedly obviously these are domestic dogs so we must always remember uh, and I should add that they weren't you know pit bulls or any of those breeds which are considered potentially more aggressive um, but a pack mentality can be a strong thing Uh, Alka, difficult to say for sure. I mean, they've got plenty of prey here. There's a, a big abundance of impalas and other smaller things here. There's lots of baby wildebeest around at the moment, lots of baby zebra. Uh, not so much in the way of small antelope like Dacre and Stirnbok. We have seen one or two Stirnbok, but really that's about it. But a plentiful supply of um, impalas, certainly. I think perhaps the, the rain actually really brings out the contrasting colours, so perhaps makes them look a little bit more sleek, if that's the right word. Uh, and don't forget, they have eaten probably this afternoon. They've got nice full bellies, so maybe look a little bit rounder. But I agree with you, uh, Alka. They do look as if they're in very good condition. It also looks as if they've decided that this rain is a little bit relentless now and perhaps with those full bellies and this rainy weather they've decided that uh, it might be a good idea to have a little bit of an afternoon snooze. Of course they are most active early morning and late afternoon. And maybe they know the impalas are here and they're just going to have a rest up and watch from a distance and maybe try their luck a little bit later.
<laughs> Thank you, Tom. Well, I'm very glad you think so. Yeah, we've had some amazing drives up here so far. We've had quite a few different lion sightings now. So this is our first official dog sighting. We saw some when we were out with Steve uh, the first day we arrived. Uh, but there have been reports of dogs in the area repeatedly, but they're just very difficult to find them sometimes because they're always on the move. Uh, plenty of elephants. We're actually saying one thing we haven't found yet is a nice big herd of buffalo, but there have been some seen uh, in the area. So, I mean, who knows? But say 70,000 hectares is a big area to roam, uh, and it's very difficult for us to cover everywhere. But there is a good network of roads, and so we're all on the radio with the other guides. I'm amazed, actually, we haven't heard anything on the radio yet of people responding. But don't forget, a lot of the game drives at the lodges will only be going out at 430 so they've got to get up into this area because there are no lodges close to where we are. So I'm sure there'll be some activity on the radio and a lot of people interested to come and see these because so Medikwe is known for its dogs. But thank you, Tom. Much appreciated. And it's a team effort. I couldn't do it without... Sorry about that. That's possibly people inquiring. Sorry, I'm just going to have to speak on the radio because I think people have just come into the area now. Uh, stations, these Makanyani are currently static on Junction, Bartia Road and BB North. It's just myself and the lock at the moment. Copy that, there's room for two. Sorry, Gwyn, I, I heard you... Uh, somebody made a comment there, uh, but I missed that. Anyway, yeah, I left the concession. There was uh, only two of us. I took charge, so there was only two of us on the concession. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Oh, Heather, you are most welcome, and you're right. It is very, very special to see these dogs. So we say it time and time again, but with not much more than 5,000 animals in the world, to see a group of seven in the wild is very, very special. I always say, if you think how many people live in a village, it's probably more than 5,000. Um, and that's the number of these animals roaming this planet. It's quite humbling when you put it into perspective like that. Okay, so these dogs just seeking a little bit of shelter from the rain at the moment. So it's one of those sort of casual drizzle, let's put it that way, which has been steadily falling pretty much since about 10 o'clock this morning. We had a bit of a cloud burst, um, probably between sort of half past one and half past two, quarter to three, and then the rain has eased, and now it's back again. But thankfully not too heavy just yet. Lady Macbeth, yes, I'm sure they have many superpowers, but uh, certainly I agree, cooperation and stamina. Um, although we should point out that from a hunting perspective, there is uh, a lot of people sort of think that it's very cooperative in the way that they hunt, but it's more because of that stamina, they just sort of do relays. We don't think it's an organised attack pattern so much as they all just chase, and as the animal wheels and changes direction, another dog has predicted that. Uh, and then we'll sort of take over the lead in terms of the hunt. So there are some suggestions that they're not as coordinated as something like lions or particularly spotted hyenas when they hunt because they're also very, very good when they put their mind to it. But stamina, absolutely, they will keep a sort of a 40, 50 kilometre an hour uh, run for kilometre after kilometre. And of course, that is their 
hunting tactic. There's none of this jump up, drag the thing to the ground and clamp its windpipe. It's nip, harass, take chunks out and the animal just kind of has to give up. Uh, the inevitability of it all is ultimately what leads to their demise. Which is why they were often considered sort of vermin and cruel. Sleepy dogs. I don't even know what day is it today. Is it Wednesday, Thursday? Yeah, you can't ask me these <laughs> I also have no concept. I was about to say, what a lovely way to spend a day afternoon. Uh, but I genuinely have no concept what day it is. But what a lovely way to spend an afternoon. Uh, to spend it with some spectacular dogs. It's the 9th, yes. That much I can tell you, but no idea what day it is, I'm afraid. We work in dates rather than days. The bush doesn't care if it's a Saturday or a Tuesday. It might be Thursday. I've got a funny feeling it's Thursday. It could be a, it occurs, it's somewhere. It's somewhere close to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, somewhere around there. I don't think it's weekend. No, it's not a weekend. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but say these dogs don't have plans. They don't follow a schedule. We do tend to overcomplicate life by. It is Thursday, I've had confirmation finally. Thanks, Gwyn. I was nudging you for a, <laughs> a genuine <laughs> bit of help there because I'm not making that up. I have no concept of what day it is. But so we tend to overcomplicate our lives with, oh, we'll have a meeting at 8.30 p.m. or a.m. On, on Tuesday. Ah, dogs wake up and go, hmm, I'm hungry. Although I'm sure there's more to it than that. Uh, sorry, Gwen, I think the question from Dark Main Lover was, do we, did we do bushwalks? Was that the question? Ah, okay, Dark Main Lover, sorry, that, I did get your, hear your question correctly. Sorry, our comms are a little bit scratchy today. Uh, probably to do with the weather. Uh, yes, they do do bushwalks here. Um, a lot of the lodges do. Obviously, it'll be dependent upon the qualifications of the guides, but the majority of the guides here do do bushwalks, um, and they are very stringent with their qualifications here, that I know for sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, as far as I know, obviously, as, it within, as with most lodges, uh, it's generally sort of three-hour game drives morning and afternoon, and then a walk off at after breakfast. But if guests particularly want to do a three-hour walk instead of a drive, or three or four-hour walks, um, then I have no doubt that that can also be arranged. There are certainly some lovely areas to walk here. It's lovely and open. Uh, you could do some stunning walks here, but so we don't have that nice river iron bush really that you find uh, over in the low felt. Uh, and there are certainly a lot of areas which you wouldn't want to walk because they are just wall to wall sickle bush and acacias like this, where, well, for one thing, it would scratch you and damage your clothing and you'd probably stand on a sickle bush within five minutes and then have to hobble home and uh, they'll puncture your foot just as easy as they will puncture a tire uh, and it'll be very very easy to bump into an elephant there or a buffalo and you would have absolutely no concept that um that it was there until you pretty much walked into its backside so pick and choose your areas carefully but it is very very special to walk out in the bush, certainly, and imagine finding the dogs on foot. It does happen sometimes, as we said. Cassie, well, I hope your dreams come true. Uh, I hope everybody, or I genuinely wish everybody has a chance to 
come out uh, and experience a safari, be it in Botswana, Zambia, East Africa, South Africa. Uh, there are so many options and each one offers their own um, unique experience. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say which one is the best because they're all excellent. And if you love nature and if you love spending time uh, with animals and learning about animals and spending time in nature, there is no better way to do it. Just bear in mind, a lot of people don't realize, of course, that on a safari holiday, you're going to get up very early in the morning. <laughs> a lot of people are quite horrified to hear that they have to wake up at sort of five o'clock or half past four uh, in the summer because it gets so hot. Of course, the animals are more active morning and afternoon. But it really is a special experience and it becomes addictive. It really does. And I've been doing this for 16 years now um, and I'm still as excited to see dogs today as I have been every time I've seen dogs over a decade and a half. Might be able to hear a distant rumble of thunder in the background. Yeah, so we've got three in view here. See one at the back, that one there on the left of screen now, which has the collar. There's one sheltering under this uh, acacia tree. Looks like possibly a scented thorn, acacia nilotica. Although I'd have to have a closer look to be sure, because there's so many out here and they all look very similar. The other four are sort of the other side of that bush, maybe about 30 metres behind them. But everybody seems to have settled down now. Uh, Mac, not yet, I'm afraid, no. Um, I would imagine that one of the alphas is the one wearing the collar. It would make sense to collar one of the alphas if you're doing research on a pack. Um, but I haven't even been able to see whether this is a, a male or a female, but maybe I must check with my binos to see if we can see anything from the way that he or she is sitting. Mm, I would say inconclusive from my view. Uh, but say, this is the first time I've seen this pack, um, and say, they, they trotted past us, ran through the bushes, We thankfully we were able to keep up with them, and they plonked themselves down here. Um, we haven't really seen much in the way of social interaction, and they have sort of spread out over, um, you know, a reasonably large distance. As I said, we've got these three here, we're all within about 10 or 15 metres from each other, and then the rest of the group are about 30, 40 metres back, sheltering under another tree. So we haven't been able to see if there is a well, we'll see what that hierarchy is yet within the um, within the group. Uh, but you're quite right to say if people don't know that there is an alpha male and an alpha female in a pack of dogs that will uh, be basically the breeding pair. There will be a beta female as well, uh, but generally speaking, it'll just be the alpha pair that produce puppies, and they can produce lots. I mean, in the teens potentially although their survival rate, unfortunately, is not good due to predation um, from various other animals like lions, leopard, uh, even pythons. Speaking of which, by the way, there was uh, a video on one of the Medikwe groups a couple of days ago. Somebody saw a python in the process of swallowing an impala, which would have been amazing to see. Uh, but there have been cases where uh, the beta female has given birth um, and were successful in raising and uh, that does happen as well that the alpha female may remove the beta female's pups and then use the beta female as a surrogate mother um, and use her milk to help sustain her youngsters as well. Are you ready for the ultimate fireside chat? 
Join James, Lauren, Cedric, and special guest Byron Soro as they pit some of Africa's iconic wild animals against each other. <laughs> Who will be crowned the ultimate king of the jungle? <laughs> Don't miss the incredible finale of our Safari Bowl weekend. Catch it live on February 11th. Then okay, I'm going up uh, Zoe's. I am heading into the direction of uh, the north uh, western corner of our property. I am going to give it a little bit of a, a scratch around this side due to the fact of that this uh, north western corner has been pumping with fantastic sightings over uh, the last uh, several days. And on top of that as well, it is nice on top of a crest. So. Um, it's not that slimy roads. As you can see, the road is not dry, it's, but it hasn't got those puddles on it. Everything is running to the lower areas. So this, these crests are always nice. So I am just gonna uh, head into this little northwestern corner and see what we can find. I'm actually hoping to uh, find some uh, frogs again for this afternoon. It'll be fantastic. And uh, yesterday we de definitely well, I had the banded rubber frog, which was quite nice and remarkable, and we got it to we got to hear it as well. So that is uh, a good to a good to view. But uh, yeah, we're just going to take a look around this side. Looking at the termite mounds as well. Sometimes you'll get those uh, giant uh, legless skinks out at this time of the day as well, with uh, the rain that's just uh, ended. So sometimes you get those big giant legless skinks around and Laura and myself found one I think it was yesterday um, afternoon or between the drives we found one uh, moving around there close to the uh, garage area where of course Wendy and Rusty is so it was quite nice to see. So I'm looking around there some snakes maybe because you know insects brings of course uh, brings out frogs. Frogs will bring out the snakes so, you know, that's a typical kind of the cycle of, uh, of the environment. And that's why I am keeping my eyes peeled for those things, definitely. Especially on the termite mounds, you get something like your stilettos, uh, your mole snakes, your burrowing asps. You get those kind of snakes hanging around the termite mounds because the termite mounds are just nice and soft. And uh, sometimes they'll go in there and search around for any little amphibian that's hanging around that side. Yeah. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, Jose, 
African bullfrogs, yes, for sure. We get African bullfrogs. Um, I think when was this morning, I think Chris had them as well. I think it was Chris as well. He had been Pridelands. I think he had the bullfrogs that side. I know you get two different bullfrog species. Sorry, I'm just trying to. I'm almost. I think they get the giant bullfrog and the African bullfrog. I think. I think the African bullfrog is the. Uh, oh, no, no, if. No, it tickled my brain yeah. The African bullfrog is more of a tawny brownish color, I think, and the giant bullfrog is your green, olive green color. I'll have to double check on that one, sorry. But uh, just now I said it's African bullfrog and it's not, so it might be the other one. So uh, maybe old Gwen can give me a shout on that one. Maybe somebody's got an answer. Sorry. No, it's, I can look, I've got my app here. I've got my app here, so, but yeah. And I've got a fantastic uh, frog app, frog and amphibian app. I, I can always look at the app. I always believe as well that when you go do frogging and that, so it's always good to have that app, good to have the noises and the identification of the frogs in that because Sometimes you, most of the times, you actually don't see the frogs. Most of the times they are actually, you know, by the time you get there, they keep quiet or they just, you know, hop away into the thicker areas, the marshy areas. So um, it's always good to listen to them. All right, well, we'll continue up uh, Zoe's. Let's head over to Ben as he's still sitting with his wild dogs. And on top of that, I will get back to you about the bullfrogs. Good luck, Cedric. I've actually got frog envy. I really enjoy frogging. Um, as far as I know, we only have the African bullfrog and the giant bullfrog. I'm not sure if there's any other ones. There's the ornate frog, which looks a little bit similar to a small bullfrog, perhaps. But back to matters in hand, we have got the dogs. Uh, we've repositioned slightly so that we can show you the other ones who were lying, although one of them seems to have gone for a little bit of a greeting with the others now. But we've still got three lying in front of us. Excuse me, I just need to update on the radio quickly. Station C's Makanyani, still static. Looks actually like River Lodge access to the east of BB Link. So one on lock and I believe two on approach. So I'm not 100% sure of the exact lock. <laughs> Excuse me, but I've just got trying to update where we are, but I've got a, a GPS and the GPS is bouncing around a little bit uh, due to the, the poor weather, I think. So I'm trying to direct people to where we are. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure, <laughs> which may work in our benefit, I suppose. Uh, LG7, I am UK born and bred. I was born and raised in the UK and uh, south of England. Um, and no, I've never really developed a South African accent per se. I've got quite a few an achs and nears in me these days. Um, but uh, no, I haven't really developed an accent. But strangely, well, a South African generally picks the fact that I'm English immediately. Um, but those in England say my accent has changed over the years. So I'm probably somewhere in between at the moment. Uh, but no, I only came over here when I was about 25. Uh, so I've been here about 17 years now, I forget, 16, 17, 18 years. I've been here a long time, nearly half my life over here doing this. Came out and I did a guide training course because I knew in my heart of hearts that this is what I wanted to do. Uh, and it seems you need to trust your gut sometimes and I don't regret a second of it. Okay, those ones have disappeared behind the trees. So those are the ones over there that we were spending time with and we just repositioned to show you these other ones. So these are three. The one that moved across was the fourth one that hadn't been accounted for and these are the other three.
I haven't really been able to sex any of these. Uh, sorry, Gwen, you, you broke up completely there. I didn't copy that at all. Ah, so I'm struggling to, to get the name. Alice or Alex? Alex, 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 Alice, Alice, Alex. <laughs> uh, well, I've never stroked an African wild dog, but I would imagine Alice, Alice, my apologies. Like Alice in Wonderland, that helps me, Gwyn. Thank you very much. Um, it will be quite coarse, I would imagine. It's not going to be a soft, fluffy uh, texture. It'll be quite coarse to deal with the rigors of living outside the whole time. Um, it's a bit like a, a lion's fur as well. I have, I have been able to touch a, a darted lion. Uh, it's much coarser than you would think. Um, but yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I don't know how you would... More like a sort of a short-haired wire terrier, perhaps, would be my best guess. But we're not allowed to touch the animals over here, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, and I've never been involved with darting or collaring dogs. I've done an elephant collaring. I've done been involved with some rhino dehorning. De um, also with some lion research, but not leopard or dogs. So we're just doing some sign language with the vehicle that's moved in um, as to where their best approach will be. Obviously very important that we all work together out here. Oh, I can hear a greater honey guide calling. I better check my Medicway list, which is currently on 202. Okay, right, whilst we... Um, playing musical cars here. Let's send you back over to Cedric, who I think is tracking something and probably musing about his frogs. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. And I'm glad with, uh, you're still with those wild dogs. But uh, if you have just uh, joined us on our sunset safari here at Wild Earth, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold. I'm the naturalist here on Wendy, and behind the camera with me, I've got Panda. Yeah, Panda, you can show your thumb. You don't have to be shy. Don't, don't be shy. There you go. And uh, yes, uh, welcome. And um, well, it's been a fantastic sunset safari so far, and I know that uh, Benny and he had his wild dogs and uh, catfish. She was enjoying some. Uh, yeah, some fish stories, fishy stories, something fishy. <laughs> and of course, uh, I've been in just doing a little bit of a birding. I'm looking for some, uh, look for those uh, black dam males uh, this afternoon around uh, Treehouse Dam. Unfortunately, no luck. They must be in that uh, drainage line there. We cannot go off line, uh, off line, <laughs> off road, uh, because uh, it is. Uh, uh, very saturated at the moment with all the rain that we've been having so but I'm sure they're in that drainage line but it's, this is a live and interactive uh, show so if you've got any questions or comments that you want to share with us please send them through hoping that we can answer as many things as possible this afternoon and yes so of course a Nick down in Karicha he had some uh, zebbies some zebra so that was nice down there in the, north, uh, in the eastern Cape Kathy, Katty or Kathy? Kathy, Katty, like Katty. Like, like. Sorry, Gwen, uh, <laughs> I think it was Kathy. I'm sure it's Kathy. Oh, Katty, Katty, oh, not Kathy, Katty. Uh, Katty, if you'd like to find a python, definitely, I would love to see. Oh. If I could see a python now, I would be so, so happy. Um, but the possibilities is there. The possibilities is there. That's why I'm just keeping an eye out on these termite mounds, especially on the termite mounds. I've seen many times after this typical rain, 
with a little bit of sun that's coming out and it gets this like, kind of humidity coming through and uh, now and again you'll have maybe a snake or two around these mounds but uh, for now it just seems like the clouds are slowly around it's still a little, still a little bit uh, gloomy but it's fine I'm sure it'll change up a bit I'm mostly heading now towards uh, Sandy Patch side just gonna see if we can pick up on anything that side from those lionesses that uh, Lauren had from this morning those in Bali girls and see if they might still as well be around this afternoon but here yeah, well, we've had a lot of rain lots of rain I think we had yesterday was 60 mils so yesterday was 60 mils from last night till now I'm not too sure. I won't be surprised. Another 60. I'm sure we're over 100, maybe 100, something like that. 120. That's just a, a long guess, but I've got to, just by the way it looks and the the, uh, the dams and how the dams have been filled up. So look at this, and this is like a, a main entrance to <laughs> definitely a bit of a slip and slide on this road, but. Uh, Luckily, old Wendy is, she is doing very well. I'm sure Lauren is looking forward in all getting Wendy back. We're just uh, making sure 100%. All right, I'm just gonna take a look. We are in the Sandy Patch area. Doing. Let's take a look around here. Oh, virtual starling. There. It's gone. It looks like it's off. Uh, a little virtual starting there, so it looks like it just took off very quickly. This is where we got those sort of banded rubber frogs last night calling. All right, so let's head over to Lauren to see how, how her safari is going this afternoon. I'm checking all the little pans and water bodies. I was actually really jealous of Cedric's bullfrog sighting this morning. I don't get jealous of sightings much, but that one sounded really cool. I like the unusual sightings. Haven't found any bullfrogs, but we do have a terrapin here. A marsh terrapin who has its body out the water, but it, there we go. Hello. What are you doing? doing but his head under the water normally it's the other way around and I saw a wonderful article online that was describing the the carapace and the plastron carapace is the top part that we can see right now of the shell and the plastron is the lower part that we can't actually see but it's joined together and sometimes people just call it the shell or they incorrectly call it the carapace carapace is top part plastron's bottom part and it was a wonderful article about how that's not the shell that is protecting the animal. It is the animal. The shell, it does protect it, yes, but it is its rib cage, which is fused together in a really unique manner. It evolved that way. Then it's covered in layers and layers of keratin and it's sort of protected by those scutes. But actually it's not something external. It's not something that the animal will not feel. It is connected to a blood supply, it's connected to a nerve supply, and therefore you must never touch them. Never ever touch them, put them on their back or carry them. Now, admittedly, I have moved a tortoise from the road before because it was a really busy road with oncoming traffic. And I thought this little guy is gonna get in trouble, but it was summer. And you've just got to be really, really careful how you touch the shell. And as long as it's summer, there's plenty of water for the tortoise. So if it does dispel that water in the bursa, the bursa sac, it can quickly replenish it. If it's winter, that's a different story. It can risk dehydration. But that shell is not something external that's not related to the turtle or the tortoise or the terrapin. It is the animal. 
and they do absolutely feel it. To what extent? Well, that can be argued. This little guy is really busy. And it is the same across Chelonia, that sort of order where you do get the tortoises, the turtles and the terrapin. It's exactly the same. Although it's different sizes and different shapes and different colours, it is fundamentally their ribcage. Picky! You're saying it's not a marsh. Let me get my binos out. You are saying that is a serrated hinge terrapin. Wow, that's possibly why it looks so big. Marsh terrapins are generally a little bit smaller, I guess. Thank you, Picky. I got that ID wrong. I did not know that. It is not a marsh. ID by Picky. It is a serrated hinge terrapin. Wow, sir, what a great find, if I must say so myself. It's so unusual to see it this way, body out, head under. But that's why you have to be really careful where you're driving right now. In most of the big puddles, there are the marsh terrapins, which is not what this is. And naturally, if you drive through them too fast, you're going to kill the marsh terrapins. You have to be really careful right now. There's a lot of life on the roads from insects, dung beetles, terrapins, snakes, all sorts of things. So you need to sort of drive slowly and really look, especially when you're going through the puddles. That is so cool. I don't know if I've had sight, a sighting of a serrated hinge terrapin before. I don't think I have gone live with one. Tom, you're asking, is it like a turtle? In the same sort of order, if you like, Tom. Turtles are seawater species. You will only find them in marine environments. Seven species across the globe. And obviously, they're all very similar, except the leatherback. The leatherback is the biggest of all turtles. And the leatherback shell is slightly different. It doesn't look like any of the other turtle species and they are marine based so in terms of is it like a turtle in a way yes with regards to the fact that it has a shell and it has the carapace and the plaster on it protects the body but otherwise it is not a turtle it is a terrapin even though it's not the marsh and i'm not sure what this little guy eats it looks to me like it's possibly feeding on the vegetation in there it looks like it's munching on some sort of the grass or the vegetation is growing out of the water, but I'm not entirely sure what the diet is for the serrated tinge. For turtles, the diets are all different. You get the green turtle that only really eats seagrass. Then you get the hawksbill turtle that eats sponges. Sponges are animals and they regularly love to snack on jellyfish. Leatherbacks are really big fans of huge jellyfish. So some are carnivorous and some are herbivorous within the sort of turtle realm. So I'm not sure what this guy's diet is, but it looks like to me he's eating the vegetation in there. This is so cool. I'm just gonna scan around and see what other life is around this little pan.
What I love about stopping around these water bodies, these small sort of collections of water, is the sounds from the insects to the frogs to just the general splashing and splishing of everything that's going on around the water. So as we watch this little terrapin, let's just sit and listen for a moment to the sounds of summer. Isn't it so nice to just stop and listen? We did have blue sky earlier, but I have a funny feeling we are in store for more rain tonight. Can you honestly believe it? Okay, we all we got is we did uh, locate or relocate on these two lionesses. Of course, from a pride called the Mbali Pride. So this is the two lionesses that uh, Lauren had this morning coming over from Boabab Dam, coming south uh, into Juma. And we are on the northwestern corner of our property. And uh, this is a... I have seen them once before. Um, that also maybe about a month and a half ago, two months ago, when I had them and I had the four young males as well that was with these two females and it looks like it's just the one older female yeah with a like a sub adult female that's a of course a, uh it's in these two and i think the other four males i'm not too sure what happened to the sub adult males um no idea so they might be in the area there has been a lot of vocalization or a lot of uh uh yeah, a lot of lion uh, roaring this morning and during last night all in this area all in this northwestern corner of uh, juma so we never know maybe they might be around here maybe they are contact contact calling these uh, two females i'm not too sure um but i think uh, we will definitely see what plays out here tonight um because these two females did come down from bobab dam so they did come south from the northern area but yeah, they are doing exactly what lions do during the daytime, and that is sleep and rest. And as you can see, they got full bellies as well. Sorry, I'm just trying to just hit a, a fly. Uh, they got full bellies, and uh, when they've got full bellies like that, they're not going to move too much, unless it's uh, they're trying to get out of the area from a new male. Jerry, definitely, I think the lion, uh, the lion saga is definitely playing out like a soap opera at the moment. I think there is so much happening, uh, so many twists in these stories at the moment, and uh, yeah, it is. It's trying to keep up with it as well is uh, quite tricky. So uh, we're just trying to wrap our heads around exactly who's who in the zoo, as they say, and uh, which ones are coming in and which ones are going out. But it's interesting. I mean, I ha I've only seen these two lionesses once before, so it's the second time I've seen them now. 
And funny enough, I actually saw them on this road as well. As I said, one month and a half ago, two months ago, I saw them just down the road, yeah, with the four male lions, all the sub adults. But yeah, it is definitely playing out like a soap opera, and I think uh, uh, the two black dam males coming in the area has definitely thrown the spanner in the works here. And especially them calling. And of course, when they make big male lions, they start calling and sticking together all the time. And then you know that uh, you know, there's things to come. On top of that as well, this morning I had that blow, that one black dam male. But there is two there. Definitely there's two. I had tracks of both of those males going into that block. I double checked this afternoon. So I think we could just see the one due to the fact of that he was quite far in. I'm sure the other one was lying maybe behind him or somewhere there in the thickets. Um, because you'll think about those males won't just leave each other, especially on such an important time of their lives and taking over an area. You know, you don't want to split up. You want to stick together and make sure when one moves, the other one moves as well. Because if you're going to take over an area, uh, you want to do it as uh, you want to be as strong as possible. These two females, what's going to happen to them? I'm not too sure. They're in the the territory of another pride called the Talamati Breakaway Pride, and they are in their they are in their territory at the moment. So that's very strange. So I don't know what's going to you know. That's why I think there's a lot of roaring, and I've got a feeling that the Talamati Breakaways. That's the three females with five youngsters. Uh, it's another pride that. that pretty much runs and I have to say the territorial uh, pride of this area of this northwestern corner I think they might be the ones that's been calling just behind our camp and I'll, I'm sure that they in that block as well because um, I picked up on their or um, their roars this morning but we'll see uh, Cindy yes definitely <laughs> I think uh, lions are doing what lions do best and that's sleep full bellies cool day perfect for them they don't have to really worry too much for now unless elephants do come here that'll be nice and if elephants do come they'll find they'll chase these lions very quickly and lions do respect the elephants I think I saw in Panda myself was sitting on Biffles or uh, oh, actually on a road called Mvubu this morning. We did hear that one male calling, and it was just north of us. And I think that could be a close to Biffles or cut line. So maybe tonight we'll see, or maybe tonight we'll hear loads and loads of lions. The call of Africa. All right, as, uh, we're going to just little sit here and just see if anything plays out further with these two lionesses. But while we do that, let's head over to Ben in the northwest in Medikwe to see how's it going that side. And I'm hoping he's having better weather than we are. Welcome back to Medikwe, everybody. We, we left the dogs and we were going to show you the first kudu that we have really been able to put on camera and then just as always when we were told that you were coming to join us they've disappeared behind those trees. Uh, while we wait to see whether we can get another look at them it's probably a good time for me to remind you at least that this weekend is Super Bowl weekend for those sports fans out there and we have our Safari Bowl challenge. Um, so on the weekend of the 11th and the 12th of February we will be having some fun and interactive safaris where we look at the various strengths that animals possess in order to survive in the wild um, and we'll be looking to well having a chat between all of us to see who wins in each of those categories and that of course will culminate in a fireside chat for explorers on saturday the 11th no sign igor huh? oh there's one there's one there's one there we are there's our kudus so that's the first kudu Igor and I have managed to put on camera. We've actually seen some beautiful kudu bulls here, but they are 
a little bit elusive uh, and they disappear into the thickets quite quickly but again because of the more open habitat here they've got some of the biggest horns on any kudus that I've seen. In fact this area is reputed to have some of the largest kudus in terms of the, the horns in the country up here so hopefully we can show you some of those. But these are females, you can see they don't have those big spiralling horns. And a group of them coming through with those characteristic big ears and the stripes down their side just to help them blend into their environments, those disruptive markings. <laughs> Tyler, well, yeah, we've have been a little bit fortunate this afternoon, certainly. Um, we've got a tiny gap from which to view them in and they've all chosen to file past it, which we are very grateful. But uh, as Gary Player, the South African golfer, once said, the more I practice, the luckier I become. The way they just drift through the bush. You can easily see, look at that behind those dead trees there. If it suddenly stood still, you would not be able to see them at all with those disruptive markings that they've got, those white lines. Yeah, I'm like sitting with the, these two lionesses, and I was just thinking, it's uh, I'm finding myself looking at them now, and they don't uh, they don't seem like big lionesses at all. They don't seem like you know if you look at the uh, those lionesses from uh, the Talamati breakaways, those three uh, the three adults, they are huge. I mean, they are definitely a proper size. Are, are these are both of them still sub adults? I'm not too sure. I'm actually see they haven't stood up yet or anything, so I'm not gonna say yes or no or how and why um, but just in what I'm seeing now just by the size they don't look uh, quite large so I'm sure maybe it's two sub adults that's lying here 
Oh, well, definitely. I know, I think, uh, I know that Michael Fleetwood did give Lauren some information this morning. I think I'll also I want to look into that as well, just to see more about the Mbali Pride. I'm not uh, too clued up with the Mbali Pride at all. And uh, I know that they do come from Manialeti Kruger Park side. And I think the sub-adults, the five sub-adults, are pretty much uh, the offspring of the S8 male. That's why they're hanging around in the S8 male's side, because the original Mbali Pride, um, I'm just going back in, on, in memory now. I think the original Mbali Pride, the, 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 the big pride itself, I think they were taken over by the Kruger male. I think it was the Kruger male that took over the Mbali Pride. So just uh, that's why I think maybe these ones had to shift away from that area. Um, if they had to stay with the, the adults, they would of course have uh, been in a lot of danger from the Kruger male. But I think that's uh, they're not old enough to mate with a male as as of yet. But as I'm saying, this is just trying to work things out here. It's always, it's always interesting. That's why it's like, why? Why are they here? There must be a reason. And I'm mean, they're quite far in the another pride's territory. And sometimes if they break away from the original pride, um, they'll also become almost like nomadic females for a short period of time until they find a little area for themselves. They find a like, like little a void in the system, in the park. And they'll see that it's a nice area for them to actually maybe begin their own pride. And that's happened many a times. It's happened with even the... Um, with the Mangeni Pride, or back in the days was known as the Chalada Pride. Uh, Chantel, lions will sleep. There's no nothing that's going to be set on rock. It's just a, a average plus minus around about 16 hours, average. So like most of the day, they'll try and conserve the energy. Um, and try and sleep as much as possible um, you know, in the heat of the day. And then you'll find uh, once that sun starts setting, and then of course the lions will start moving around as they are nocturnal cats. And they'll try and move around and they can use the element of darkness to their advantage if they are busy hunting and that side. But uh, yeah, they can, they can sleep quite a bit. That's why, I mean, Lauren left them here this morning and they still practically at the same spot so they haven't moved at all especially if they've got full bellies uh, and there's no intention on heading out here and looking for any prey species unless they're getting how can i say pushed by uh, uh, the uh, by the telemati pride for instance But yeah, being sub-adults, I think, as I say, I think uh, definitely by the size, they look like they're the same age. Um, yeah, so they will, once they get to about three and a half, four years old, once about four years old, then they're in a, like a safe zone. A uh, safe zone meaning that the females can go into heat, uh, then it becomes attractive to the male. So then the male will kind of, of course say, well, you know, now you are, you know, we can use you, you know, now you can be part of, uh, you can be put in, you can be a pride inside of my territory uh, because you're going to sire my cubs and that. But if they cannot go into heat yet and it's under the age of three and a half years old, around about there, then it's a little bit of a problem for the younger females if, uh, if another male gets hold of them. And that's what I say with the Manganis, that's happened. They used to have a female, old female called uh, a Bibi. So old Bibi, what's happened, Bibi used to, of course, uh, back in the days, um, there was, of course, a coalition called the Mapojo, six males. And, of course, they had cubs in that, and the cubs got to about three years old. And um, it was a big pride, a formidable pride, the Chalolas. And, of course, uh, a new coalition of males came in called the Majingalans. Four males came in, actually it was five males, and... Two of the Mapojos, Kinky Tail and Mr. T, killed the one out of the five males in the morning. And that evening, the four Majingalans came back in to the Sabi Sands, got hold of one of the Mapojos called Kinky, uh, Kinky Tail on Gauri Main, not too far south of uh, Juma, and killed him. And of course, his other brother ran 
to the west. But now the Cholala pride was now under, th- the, you know, because they still had cubs, not cubs, but sub adults, pretty much almost the same age as these two. And of course, four of the females uh, disappeared with an older female called Bibi. And the Bibi is a female that she did not have a tail. So she took the four young uh, sub adult uh, females away from the Cholala pride and left the rest of the pride members to mate with the new males, the Majingalans. And she went off and she disappeared and she went all over the reserve. They were seen, she was seen on the northeastern corner, she was seen in the southeastern corner, in the west, in the east. Eventually, BB returned back to the pride. The four sub adults became adults at that time, got it to about three and a half, four years old. And those four females formed their own pride called the Mang- Mangeni pride. And then they were situated in an area called Sangita and also in the west, the southwestern corner of the Sabi Sands and eventually they became a formidable pride, absolutely a formidable pride. They started mating with, of course, the dominant males of those areas and uh, that's how that pride started. So it's exactly the same as these two females that that could happen to them as well. So one day, once they get to that age of four, they'll create their own territory and start mating with the dominant males of that area. But anyway, Enough with uh, that little bit of history. Let's head over to Manuleti, um, Madikwe, with uh, Ben. Uh, thanks, Cedric. Oh, yeah, we've got a young elephant bull now. Everything's happening on this road, known as Shepherd's Tree Road, because there are plenty of shepherd's trees here. But yeah, just a young bull, this one. Uh, probably looks like a, in his late teens. I don't see any others in the vicinity. But of course, they do communicate with one another over large distances. So just because we don't see any others doesn't mean that he hasn't got a friend somewhere or an older bull. And this would be his Ascari. He had his head stuck in the thorn tree there. Of course, you might have noticed those beautiful eyelashes that the tree uh, that the tree has got, that the elephant has got, and those vicious thorns and a lot of the things here. So it just helps protect their eyes when they do exactly that and stick their head into a tree. Uh, but elephants very quickly move, feed, and then move on again. You can see already he's decided that that tree was not to well not not to his liking but he decided to go on to slightly greener pastures but you can see all those white thorns on the majority of the trees out here although those white thorns are not as vicious as they look you can easily snap those with your fingers uh, they're not as harsh as say the sickle bush thorns which are more sort of stems almost like modified branches victoria you are very welcome everybody's thanking us this afternoon eagle we're obviously doing a good job they are also one of my favourite animals. Just getting distracted because you might be able to hear that there's a bunch of guinea fowl somewhere off to our, off to the right of the elephant that have just gone mad. And I'm trying to figure out why. Whether there is a predator in the area or whether or not there's a bird of prey somewhere. That is a guinea fowl, Gwyn, if you can hear that. It's angry guinea fowls shouting at something or somebody. They're just keeping an eye open. Maybe something's moving through the grass. But they'll do that potentially for a snake, for a bird of prey, for a predator of sorts. Could be a lion. I, I don't want to say the, the other L word because they are very, very, very rarely seen here. But you never know. The way it's going on this road this afternoon, anything's possible. It's most likely a bird of prey. We do have a lot of birds of prey here, things like pale chanting goshawks, African harry, uh, African harry hawks, the the gymnogene, sorry, not gymnogene, African hawk eagle. I always get those two mixed up. We've seen tawny eagle, uh, lots of different kites, yellow-billed and black-shouldered kites. <laughs> the way he's standing on the bush there, just pinning it down. Mm. 
If there is something there, the elephant's not reacting to it, although there's no reason that he necessarily should, but as a young elephant, he could react to lions, perhaps. But those guinea fowl are definitely not happy about something. Ah, they're, they're going to be about to be fed a bomb by an eagle. Ah, it just landed on the top of that tree at the back. That's what they were shouting at, up there. So that eagle just flew out. Let's see if we can get an ID on that. Possibly a tawny. Small for a tawny. Difficult to say for sure. I might be tempted to say lesser spotted eagle, but it's a little bit far away to be absolutely sure. Yeah, maybe lesser spotted. Okay, let's send you across to Lauren, who I think is at one of the water holes. I've been trying to spot some dragonflies. I have in fact spotted many dragonflies, but they're not landing. What we have spotted though, are two very wobbly, <laughs> jiggly <laughs> spiders hanging off the log in the middle of the water body. Look at this. I assume they are alive. It's very difficult to tell. And I think this is what they call in South Africa, daddy long legs. Needs no further explanation, big long legs. But in the UK, where I'm originally from, daddy long legs are a completely different thing. They're more of a sort of fly type animal. And they obviously have long legs as well, but they're not a spider, they're very much an insect. But I think this is what South African called daddy long legs. I don't know what they're doing there, but it doesn't look terribly fun. I feel dizzy watching them. <laughs> Are you able to zoom in a tiny bit closer, Dobby? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this is some sort of mating ritual, courtship. Mm -hmm. Valentine's Day is coming. No, I'm joking. I don't know what they're doing. They do look alive to me because, of course, Spiders do molt, so they leave behind their exoskeleton. So sometimes from a distance you might see what looks like a spider, but it's just an empty shell, it's just the exoskeleton. <laughs> Fascinating. Either way, they're trapped, unless they can walk on water. They are trapped in the middle of the dam. And this dam is called Treehouse Dam. And Cedric had a male lion here this morning. So we're just sort of scanning the area to see if we can see any signs of him. It's a male lion that I have not met before. The black dam male. Both the black dam males actually might be here. Cedric only saw one. But of course it has rained all day and we don't off-road when it's been raining this much. So it might be tricky, we might not find them, but I would really love to meet them. to see a dragonfly first though. Why are you guys not landing? Most likely because it's been raining all day, they're actually just maximizing the amount of ambient light that they can to hunt. Normally when it's really hot, the sweltering hot sort of days of summer, they take rests and they will rest on a blade of grass or a piece of vegetation. But because it's just rained all day, they've probably been hiding. So now that it's dry, it's time to hunt. Austin, you're saying you think the spiders might be nervous from all the water around it. Very possibly, they're trapped. Or they're just dancing and dangling from a piece of web. I'm not sure. It's quite tricky to see. You do get, of course get spiders that can walk on water, like the Pell's fishing spider. They can 
Did you see that dragonfly? Yeah, he Did came, it land? He came flying through. I flying think. through. It didn't land, unfortunate. And the fish and spiders can walk on water. And when I stayed in the Amazon for a while, we stayed in the Amazon for quite a few months, actually. And it was absolutely terrifying. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. And the insects there are quadruple the size that they are here. Everything is so much bigger and brighter, like everything is on steroids. And the spiders were just everywhere. I had really bad arachnophobia at the time and I was trying ha hard to manage it and handle it, but it was difficult. And my relief was when I went into the water to bathe and we were bathing in one of the tributaries, which is of course dangerous because you do get anacondas and you do get caiman crocodiles. Neither of which you want to meet when you're bathing. But this was a very shallow part of the tributary and we used to go in to wash and there were water spiders everywhere. Big ones. Really not what you want when you're trying to hide from the spiders or when you're trying to bathe. But I don't think the daddy long legs are, so Austin, you're right, they're trapped. And they're not getting out for a long time until this water levels go down. Oh, well, Lauren's got daddy long legs. Nice. Those are quite interesting spiders. Always find them around the households. They're very good. They catch mosquitoes. That's what they're good at. Catching mosquitoes. That's it. Still with uh, our two lionesses. Still very, very fast asleep. I might just leave them very shortly and just go and do a little bit of a, a bumble around one of the blocks around in this area just to the east of us. And I just want to double check on other stuff because, as I said, there was a lot of other calling that was happening this morning from the lions. And you never know, maybe one or two has popped out onto a road and enjoyed the the sandy areas. Because, especially on like big rains, you hardly ever really see lions enjoying the thick grass and the wet grass. It just becomes quite uncomfortable for them. Not to the end of these lionesses, they are definitely in lion, lion la la land. Lion la la land. <laughs> Triple L. And I see a little pull spotted owlet calling just now behind us, and I think I might actually head into that area first. And not too far from us. Uh, calling. Uh, I'll see if I can find that owl. It'll be fantastic, especially the late afternoons. They do a lot of their hunting at this time of the day. Those small little owls. More your diurnal owl than a nocturnal owl. Okay, so we're still with our Dazzle of Zebra and they've chosen a very interesting spot to come to probably like the biggest junction of roads in the whole area you know they've got this huge open clearing to go to and this is the particular spot that they've chosen but if it floats their boat good for them and it's been very very interesting to watch the behavior between this foal and its mother very exaggerated types of movements and um, sort of bonds between the two of them this afternoon. The little foals obviously feeling very playful. And mom is, is really standing up to the task. Remember, it's pretty much all up to her. The male doesn't 
really play much of a role in raising that foal. Remember for zebra, the mare will give birth to just a single foal. So it's not like she has the, the possibility of having a, a second one at the same time and the, the two youngsters can play together like a lot of the, the cat species, your lions, leopards and cheetahs. even seen this little youngster almost jump up on onto the top of mom's neck very strange playful types of movements Gerard thanks for the question 100% they are playful I think instinctively they will be quite playful it's just been interesting to see this afternoon those movements have been almost a little bit more exaggerated than anything else and I guess that is one of the amazing things of really spending a good amount of time in the bush is that we're not just looking at a zebra we know exactly which zebra this is you can get you know to have a good amount of, of time to get to know certain individuals and this, this foal has always been a playful foal, but this afternoon for some reason it just seems to be extra playful. Possibly because the bad weather's come and gone. You know, we haven't had any rain this afternoon and prior to that it's rained for most of the day. So potentially this little foal's feeling quite happy with life. He's a little happy camper. See, he's moved off and he's giving mom a little bit of space now, which I'm sure she's very glad to have. comes our stallion on the right hand side so if you look at his body it's quite likely that he's just done a little bit of rolling around in the dirt you can see he's a whole lot dirtier than what the female is on the left she looks crisp and clean she's just used uh... <laughs> uh, makes me laugh you know there used to be that ad on on TV for it was like Omo or something like that, one of those one of those brands. Is enough and it comes out like pure white. I mean her coat is dazzlingly white compared to that stallions on the right hand side. Uh oh, here comes our fall coming for round two of the play session with mum. Gonna just casually making its way across. Mom's looking across like oh no. Here comes another round. Tammy, I saw the tracks of the buffaloes earlier. And I did go and have a, a look for them. They're not too far from here somewhere, I'm sure. The tracks that I saw were very fresh. And I have been keeping an eye out for them, just to see if there is any chance of them popping out here. And I have taken an exploratory drive into that deep valley of, of where I think they are. A little bit tricky as it's quite dense there. But I haven't managed to, to come right with them this afternoon. Remember for those buffaloes, they are ruminants, so there's a good chance that they've settled down in the block. So the block being in between sort of where all the roads are, if you've got a, a square sort of grid of roads, you know, just for example, they could be lying down within that block. And maybe this afternoon they'll get up and start to move around and about for the afternoon. But you will be the first to know if we do find the buffalo. But I think for now we're going to take you across to Medikwe where Ben's got a lovely herd of elephants. Nick, that sounds like an interesting one. Well, this road just is the road that keeps on giving. From one elephant, we now have a group of elephants. There's uh, quite a few youngsters in this group, uh, but they're a little bit off to the right.
will reposition for you at some point. Also, it looks as if there's a very dark cloud building over us, so we'll cross fingers that we don't get a torrential downpour. But this has turned out to be a lovely sighting, and somewhere in the background there was some giraffe earlier as well. I think let's just try and move forward a touch. You go and get the whole herd because there's probably about 15 or 20 elephants here and there's quite a few youngsters, very, very cute. They just kind of, we actually, looks as if we've got a dung beetle trapped in one of our ponchos, which has been driving us mad with this strange scratching noise, but we just figured that out. So we were in the process of trying to free it and we looked up and what was like three elephants had suddenly become like 20. But uh, hopefully we can show them to you right about now. There we go, look at that. Lots of little ones in there as well. They're just slowly moving. You can see that big cloud I was talking about in the sky there as well. Uh, Chris, well, the camera is probably making it look a little bit closer than it is. There you go, that's the top of the car. You can just see. Uh, on the right. So we're probably 30 meters from the closest one, but they're constantly moving the whole time. Um, I still haven't built up sufficient trust of these Medicoe elephants to necessarily let them get super close to us yet. But if they do move in this direction, they all look very relaxed. They haven't reacted at all when we've started the vehicle. Um, so they do seem to be quite chilled. And we're in an area where there are quite a few lodges which will mean, of course, that they're a little bit more used to vehicles. But you never know with elephants. You always have to err on the side of caution because, quite simply, they're very big and very strong. <laughs> ah, but they've generally been pretty placid. So we've had one or two slightly aggro females from time to time. Uh, the bulls have been pretty good to us so far. But this is a lovely family group. As always, a couple of boys at the back. Well, that looks like a female. No, that's a female. I think there's one bull off to the left. But they look like there's sort of four or five little ones there, but very, very nice to see. Did you know that explorers are watching ad-free right now? Right this very minute, they are listening to the soothing sounds of nature and seeing uninterrupted content. I am shaking with excitement. But don't fret, you can try out an Explorer subscription in monthly, six monthly and yearly options. Experience nature naturally, totally ad-free. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature.
just going to try and get you another look at these elephants. We've got some rather ominous thunder very close by now as well. So we're going to have to see what the future holds. But for now, let's show you this lovely herd of elephants here. You can see they're constantly moving in classic elephant fashion, but you can see there's lots of little ones there in the distance. You can see at least four or five that are under the age of, I would think, three or four years of age. And if you can hear the rather deep booming thunder in the background. <laughs> Look at these two having a kiss. It is, after all, nearly Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'm giving it a, giving it a bit of a nudge. We might get some mounting behaviour here. We might find that one sort of tries to climb onto the back of the other one. Quite normal to see amongst youngsters, just playing, a little bit of dominance, but all in good fun. Or perhaps not. We often see young bulls doing that to each other. Uh, Matthew, I probably am at, at the moment, just because I feel probably completely naively that I understand and can read the Juma elephants better because I've worked in the Sabi Sands for many years. And more importantly, they have had a lot more exposure to vehicles because the Sabi Sands is a busier area. So they're generally a little bit more um, relaxed. But say, not to say that we haven't had any horrible experiences here. Um, but sort of, you know, just sort of being comfortable with an area that you know gives you a kind of a false sense of security. It's not to say that, uh, you know, anything could happen at any time. Um, probably take more unnecessary risks, perhaps, uh, in the stands, because I trust the elephants there. And when you come to a new area, it's all part of the, the learning curve, really. Uh, meeting new animals, understanding their behaviours. But so I think we're, all of us are pretty good at reading the body language of an animal. Ooh, there was a big flash of lightning off to the right. I think let's just move up slightly. We've got those ones walking down the road in front of us. But yeah, it looks like we might be in for some pretty tumultuous weather very shortly. And the wind is blowing that storm cell right over us. And we may have to duck for cover shortly. But let's see if we can get some more visuals. It's a lovely herd, this. Got a big cow just up here in the road, so just giving her a little bit of space. You can see she keeps sort of glancing over her shoulder, just keeping an eye on us, but nothing more than that. Okay, let's see if that works. But what a great afternoon we've been having. Have I put the pot? I've put the pole right in the way. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, Igor. Uh, you'd think by now, after a week of being here, I'd have figured this car out in its dimension. Sorry, everybody. Let me try that again. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Let's see if we can give you another quick view of these elephants. There we go, nice big female, that one. I think that's the biggest one that I've seen here, so she's likely to be the matriarch. She's got a little one with her. I wonder if she's not pregnant by the look of her as well. It's about right. That little one does look around about two years of age. Um, so she potentially could be falling pregnant again now.
Okay, let's send you back over to Juma and Cedric, who is still enjoying his bumble. Well, good luck, Ben. Uh, I actually thought uh, the Madikwe weather was uh, looking a little bit drier than uh, Juma's, but uh, clearly not. It seems like... Uh, you're also having quite a thunderstorm that side. Um, and talking about weather and talking about thunderstorms, and I saw quite a few videos today um, where people were posting from the Kruger National Park, the Crocodile, uh, Crocodile River, the Sabi River, the Sand River, all the rivers that's coming through pretty much from the High Felt area through the Low Felt towards uh, the Kruger Park. And uh, all those rivers are absolutely chock and block with water right right to the brim the one bridge is very high i mean i think the one bridge is about geez six seven meters eight meters maybe more above the normal uh, level of the, the river itself and uh they showed a video of that today and that uh, the water was just going below, uh, below the bridge just just below the bridge so yeah that is definitely some proper water proper rain that's been happening around that area of this area incredible i didn't think so i thought like last last week i was getting a little bit worried last week i was thinking to myself wow what a dry summer hot and dry summer and, oh. <laughs> almost almost blew off the vehicle <laughs> JP, you know, enjoy the line dynamics, the stories of the line dynamics in the Sabi Sands. Yeah, well, JP, I think it is... <laughs> I th I'm slow on my seat. Thanks, Gwen. Um, just barely on my seat. Uh, but yes, uh, JP, I think it's, uh, line dynamics is very like very nice to like, understand. And especially, like, I was talking to Panda about it now. And what's nice about the stories is, like, especially if you've been here for a while and you've seen it happening, uh, first hand and just to see how the, the whole thing changes and shifts from year to year or from coalition to coalition and um, take over take over and um, it's amazing how how lines the social side of things how lines are so well kind of connected with one another when it comes to uh, the family itself from the, the prides um, I was talking about uh, um, Bibi taking those four youngsters away from the area just to keep them safe from those new males, the Majingalans. And then we were talking about now Chela, now from the Kuhumas. I mean, Chela decided to do the same kind of thing, almost the same idea on taking the sub-adults away from the area and keeping them safe and, com and taking them completely out of the territory that they know. And she just knows better than they do. Of course she's got experience and it's amazing that you always get that one female that decides that stuff and, and that's why I can't wait to see Chela again I'm actually I'm hoping that that Chela and the rest do come back onto Juma because uh, it'll be sad if I don't see that uh, lioness again she is absolutely incredible she reminds me of BB she actually reminds me of a female from the Styx Pride as well Gorgi an old female um, so there's uh, certain females that take that responsibility and take the, and not take those youngsters under their their wing. Oh, that's amazing. I think that's like just a bond. And it's like these two lionesses now, these two youngsters. I mean, I can imagine the bond between these two. It must be absolutely strong, so strong, I and mean, it has to be. They can't uh, not to be. They need to keep. You know, they need to be with each other, be, be with each other for the rest of their lives, and create a new territory, a new pride, new babies. Yeah. Line dynamics is always interesting. Always. Some people think it's boring. I don't. I think it's uh, fascinating. I think it's. A, I think to me it's a bigger story to it. It's like if you look at the the, the bigger story on on dynamics of uh, the lion prides and coalitions around you. It's awesome. So the sun is starting to come out. 
<laughs> and I did have some Cape Glossy starlings on this tree for us here. Remember, they've got that incredible iridescence, but they've literally just flown off. So nice that we do have a little bit of sun starting to make an appearance for us. Some hoddy dars flying across. And I think we may potentially have a beautiful sunset tonight. If the, the clouds part a little bit for us, we should get an amazing view of some of the clouds with the sunset. You can see we've got some zebras down in the, in the clearing there. So we're looking down on the Kariha River here. And slowly but surely, we're starting to get a lot of different species starting to come down to the open clearings here. We've obviously we've got the zebra. And see we've got a few of bless book here. And if you look far back on the left hand side of the frame, there is a big herd of impala starting to make their way down. So everybody's starting to move and shake, starting to come around and about. It looks like potentially most of our rain may be finished, which is quite nice, at least for us. And I'm hoping that we'll get a little pocket of the sky opening up tonight. If you were with us yesterday, you would have seen our sunset here at Kariha was stunning. Okay, so our starlings have come back to the tree and I'm going to take us across here, hopefully in time before they move off. Oh, stay there my man. I feel like these starlings are just against me. There's a group of eight of them that keep flitting up and down. There is actually one that's still inside there. In the shadow part of that tree on the slight right hand third, he's sitting there. So what I'm going to do, now he's just gone out, I'm just going to wait here for another few seconds, just in the hope, I mean these starlings keep coming and going. And it really is stunning when one of them does pop up on this little shrub, the sun comes out and hits them. Remember they've got that very vivid yellow eye as well. If, the, if they do come and read the script and sit here, it is a stunning a stunning view with a combination of that yellow eye and that plumage. You see we've got one sitting just in the shadows there. So they've got quite a sort of like a whiny type of call. They are, these starlings are beautiful. I feel like they're, they're actually quite an underrated type of bird. You know, because if it is uh, overcast, it's definitely not the best looking bird in the world. But when the sun does come out, they are absolutely stunning. So you can really see that yellow eye there that I was talking about. Off he goes. There we go. They've made us work for it, but we have got it. We finally got our view. Although it was brief. But it has been a, an absolutely incredible day here at Kariha so far. There we go.
They're coming to read the script. Look at that. Edwards, yes, 100%. Their iridescent color, it does make them very special. And you can see now we've got a bit of sun coming out. You can see that yellowish eye that we were talking about. I don't think I've ever found it so hard to to track some birds before. I mean, you know, there's there must be, like I said, eight of them, ten of them. And they've really made us work to get this view. But it has been worth it. Look at that one on the left, that iridescent sheen on its chest there. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, while it looks like our starlings are preparing to flit off once again, I think we'll take you back across to Cedric and see what his lions are up to. Well, Nick, I'm glad that your starlings have uh, read the script. Clearly, my two lionesses did not read the script. They were supposed to be moving by now. No, I'm just joking. I think the two girls are still very much uh, asleep here. As I said, when they've got full bellies, you're not going to get too much movement out of them uh, for now. But I'm sure once that sun starts setting, uh, these lionesses will get up and they will start moving. Especially that they are youngsters. Um, they are sub-adults, so they're not going to hang around here for too long. Because, I mean, I can imagine at this point in time, it's, uh, it's testing times for these two girls. Very much testing times, coming through other territories of other prides, trying to see where they can go, bumping into other prides. They also have to hunt, they also have to eat. So testing times for them. But I think these testing times for a lions like this now makes a pride much stronger. And they learn, they have to learn now. So it's not that they've got the adults that can do the killing for them and that now, you know, they've got to, they know how to, they know how to hunt. But now they need to really work much harder on those hunts. So, as I say, you get thrown into the deep end sometimes, that's when you have to learn how to swim. And that's good for these two. Especially that they've got full bellies, so it just shows you they are successful. But it's such a contrast, such a beautiful contrast with uh, this tawny coats of the lions at the moment here, yeah, with this beautiful green grass that's surrounding them. I think that's, I love that contrast. It's the same as your leopards. So if you see like a leopard walking over this, like these green patches, and it's like that gold comes out with those rosettes. It is quite, quite stunning. No, oh, Carol, definitely there's so much more to lions than a lazy lazy cat label. I mean, I think that I think that lazy cat label, yes, because we do see them during the daytime. Most of the time they are sleeping, for sure. I mean, that is going to be uh, the case, how we see it through our eyes. Um, but you must remember now, all of a sudden, when these lions are going to, or we've gone to sleep, and these lions are out hunting and running away from other lions and patrolling and doing their things so uh, you know night time it's the night time that they occupy and that's why i think they got that label of being lazy as lions but once they do move they do become very exciting i love following lions especially when they're on a hunt especially when i find lions that's uh, of course like male lions that's busy roaring and like realizing that there's other males in the territory, I tell you that is the most exciting, one of the most exciting sightings I've had. And uh, I mean, that's exactly with those Majingis, with the Birminghams coming in with the Matimbas. I mean, I saw those uh, coalitions taking over from other coalitions in the Northern Sands. So I was very fortunate seeing that whole process. And um, it gets exciting. That's just roaring all over the show. One moment you hear the lion on the western side of the northern Sabi Sands, the next moment you hear the lion's roaring center, then on the eastern side, it's all over. And then it's the funniest thing actually to see the guides 
in the vehicles. All of a sudden they're going to the one and then they hear the line roaring to the south and oh, they turn, change direction and they go down to the southern side and oh, they hear it behind them. And, <laughs> and, they, and they, it, It's almost like what happened this morning when we were hearing those lines roaring. Actually, that, that's what happened this morning. It's like I heard them north of our camp. They were roaring, they were going crazy. I went out there, I went to, of course, the northern side of the camp. Next moment, I hear the lions are roaring further ear west towards this side. Of course, Lauren was here. And then I heard lions roaring down to the south. And I turned around and went south. So, <laughs> and it gets exciting. I think, to me, lions are exciting. Is, especially when that, when that whole kind of uh, cat chasing cat kind of such a scenario. That's, yeah. I mean, they're not small cats. I mean, a big, a big lioness will get easy up to about 140, 150 kilograms. I mean, that's a big cat. And of course, uh, males are around about 200 kgs. So yeah, even with uh, with with that kind of uh, things like this morning, what you know, what played out this morning, trying to f trying to find those lions. What's happening? And even like when it's telling me, even like there in uh, Janesburg at the MC, um, all the directors and the MCs, everybody gets so excited because it's just that it's, it, it becomes like a, that story's p playing out now, you know. And that's what I like. It's almost like a movie. It always starts off slowly. You got like the beginning of it, and you know, get to know everybody and all that, and then all of a sudden you got your action-packed moment in the center, and like almost to the end of the story, and then of course you got the ending. You know, so that's how I, it's like almost like it's like directing a, a sh like how can I say a story, a movie. Yeah, you know, and I love it. But it is a very, a very slow story. But yes, as you know, we've got the user-generated content uh, that's uh, up. And uh, we are looking for all the unique and jaw-dropping and most amazing and beautiful wild animal sightings from all of you viewers to use across our platforms. And in return, you can also earn money and win prizes. And you can also see your names in the credits on the Wild Earth TV shows. So please, all the viewers can go to our website. And that is wildearth.tv. And just go and click on the content creator button. And it will give you more info about the user generated content. While we are just watching these big tawny cats having a cat nap, let's head over to Lauren as she's watching some smaller critters. Finally found my favorite. Some of you might not enjoy this because it's very creepy and it's crawly and it maybe m makes you feel a bit ugh. But these animals are incredible. Completely underrated are the termites. Termites and the termite mounds come as one, almost like a super organism. And they really are the backbone of any ecosystem, especially the ecosystem we are in right now. And because of all the rains, they're hard at work. Now, I always like to talk about the senses and how animals sense their world around them. We saw the catfish that use these barbels, but what about termites? The majority of termites have really poor vision and the question is, can they actually see at all or are they completely blind? The answer lies in the role that they play in the colony. They all have different roles and not all roles have equal eyesight. Can you believe that? So the kings and queens, they're known as the royals, obviously, are the only members of the colony with completely functional eyesight. They can see. So they depend on their vision to sort of break away from the colony 
and start their own colony. These are the alate, the reproductive ones, before they become the king and queen, if you like. And they only really develop their true functional eyesight after they mature. So until that point, they're not really good at seeing. But that's okay because they don't really need to see. And that's why the workers, the soldiers, all the other termites, they don't have to really see. They are said to be able to distinguish sort of light and dark, but they can't see color and detail because they don't need to. Why don't they need to? Well, termites mainly communicate through chemicals and also vibrations. If you've ever seen a head banging termite, it's quite something to see. The soldiers will actually bang their head, bang, 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 like a drum on the ground, creating vibrations. And these vibrations, it really does sound like a drum, alert all the other mound mates know that a threat is approaching. Artwork is coming, pangolin is coming. And they can bash their head on the ground on average 11 times per second. That literally gives me a headache just thinking about that. 11 times per second. They are banging their head really hard and fast on the ground. That is just crazy. And the vibrations actually travel around 40 centimeters. That's longer than a ruler. That must be, what, about 13 odd inches? Now, that doesn't sound very far to us. But if you're a termite, that's, that's far. And remember, whoever picks up on it can then start drumming. And then it continues and continues and continues. And the signal, the distress signal, if you like, gets further and further away. And I believe there was an experiment where they took termites and put them in petri dishes. And they tried to sort of use vibrations to send signals. But the termites actually paid no attention. They will only pay attention when it is another termite. It's very specific vibrational frequency that they're listening to. It's not just a random drum. They're in tune to a very specific frequency. And when they tried to replicate that in the lab, it didn't work and the termite didn't respond. Carl, you say it always amazes you, the small things in the bush. Absolutely. And when you can't find the big things, resort to the small things and you'll be blown away at what you can find out. Termites are such a paradox, you know. They do cause, I think it is, around $5 billion, $5 billion worth of property damage in the U.S. every single year. Mm, that's a lot of money. So a lot of people maybe don't like termites and they think that they are pests. But they are crucial for ecological balance. They are unbelievable for sustaining life in nature. And they're a paradox within themselves as well because they're strong enough to eat a house, but actually their bodies are so soft and delicate that they can instantly dry out if there's not enough moisture. Totally underrated. And if you think these tiny insects are the ones that create these huge mounds. And that is amazing. And they work together like one big giant super organism. Busy, 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 busy. I was going to say busy bee, but they're not bees. <laughs> and even when you can't see them and there's no moisture, they are still inside working hard. I think I'm going to sit here a little while longer and continue to watch these busy termites.
all it is uh, to in Bali sub-adult lionesses and they are still very much asleep but I was saying that to Panda as well that I think as soon as any of these lions that's around here now starts roaring especially that the light is now you know it's starting to get now nice and dark and the sun is busy setting so you'll find as soon as any of these lions starts roaring in this area I'm sure these two uh, lionesses I'm sure their heads will get up uh, very quickly they'll pick their heads up very quickly and uh, try and work out what's happening you know because they know that uh, they are very vulnerable where they are now at the moment in this area and uh, that's why I say if they do hear any of these lions calling it's going to be quite interesting to see what their reaction will be to those calls and they won't call now the, the females that this is where they try and rather be silent because they are moving like almost like a stealth, stealthily kind of through the other lion's territories and uh, they don't want to call. If they do call, it's pointless and then it's like almost like, you know, you know you're kind of giving yourself away and your location. So they're not going to have any vocals on them tonight. Unless they want to pick up on those four young males, other sub-adults. That's, that's a, I'm not too sure where they are. I think they might be maybe a little bit further north because it seems like these two, uh, their tracks have come down from the north. So I think, and those are quite far from the north, from them, almost like close to the Manileti boundary. So if these two have come uh, at least a good maybe five, six kilometers last night. And I just got that information from another guide. Maybe the other young males might be behind them, not too far from the side. Because I know Lauren said she did have some some lions calling just behind the dam wall here at Bobab Dam. Walter, you say the uh, the story reminds you of a Lagatha in Pridelands. Uh, Walter, we all, I think Lagatha, you know more about Lagatha. Yeah. Like Bender? Hmm. I haven't seen Lagatha, I'm not too sure on her story, but I think she was, she broke away from the pride as well. Yeah, she was left, the mother was killed. Oh, thanks, Gwen. Yeah, I know, I know about Lagatha, I know, like, I've, like I, but I, don't, I don't know the, her, uh, the composition of her pride. And apparently Lagatha is a lone lioness. Uh, that does not have a pride. So yes, and that does happen. You look at the Chilala uh, female, that remaining Chilala female, as well as the remaining Shemungwe female. Uh, not long ago, I think in the last two years, they were just by themselves, and then all of a sudden, mated with, uh, the, I think the Shemungwe female mated with uh, Plains Camp male uh, males, and I think uh, she, she's got young sissy, if I'm not mistaken, cubs in the west, somewhere in the west. So, yeah, things like that can, from being a, a, like a, I'm not going to say a solitary, solitary female, all of a sudden you can have a pride in a matter of three, four years, you can have, be a formidable pride again. You can imagine having four female cubs, they'll remain with a pride, or remain with a mother. And all of a sudden you've got five strong members. And that's how it used to be with the sticks, even in Kuhumas. One stage there were so many, I think there were 16, 17 in Kuhuma Pride. I mean, I'm talking about strong, strong female, big females. And then the numbers uh, dwindled all of a sudden. A few of them got old, some of them got killed by males. The numbers almost went to like three or four. And then all of a sudden the numbers went back up again. So it goes through its waves all the time. Hmm, Baobab Girl, we are sitting just south of Baobab Dam. Well, Baobab Girl, any news on the SA to mail? I've got a feeling that he, we, I've, I, I feel that he was the one that was calling around Mvubu Road, so that is just north of our camp, but towards the cut line here. So I think he is uh, maybe give and take two kilometers east from where we are. That's what I think. I think it's him. When I heard a male calling this morning, just one. 
and he is a he is a solo male, solitary male. He hasn't got brothers in his coalition. So, and I did hear that that male call this morning. Definitely not too far from from our camp. That's what I say. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of time here. It's getting dark, and if he starts calling again, you'll see definitely these two girls. <laughs> Their heads up, or the heads will go. Uh, I'll pick their heads up very quickly, very, very quickly. Hmm. Oh, she's getting bothered by flies, and there's a yeah, there is lots of flies here. Yeah, it's been biting Panda and myself the whole afternoon. I think this uh, wet weather has brought out so many flies. So many insects, so many creepy crawlies. I think definitely old Lauren is in an element with all these creepy crawlies. She loves them to bits. Um, I love them, but uh, she loves them. It was the same as uh, old Gwen in uh, our, our director today. Apparently she loves spiders. She's a big fan of spiders. She just said into my ear that she, she can't wait to hold a tame tarantula. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I don't think she likes spiders. I think I'm actually... I think I... I think when it might be the same as me when it comes to spiders. Nervous. Arachnophobia. <laughs> She's definitely agreeing on that. <laughs> oh, a stretch, come on. Yeah, we need to do a little bit of a rollover and a stretch and a yawn. You have to get your head, you have to start grooming now. It's getting a little bit late now. I had no luck looking for the male lion, but it's been a really tricky day. Rain, no off-roading, it's been tr very tricky. For a kingfisher. Oh, where do you see the kingfisher, Davi? Oh, well spotted, I did not even see that. The noisy one. Are you going to call for us? <laughs> Don't look at me like that, you call all the time. Now I'm getting the side eye. <laughs> this is, of course, a woodland kingfisher. I love kingfishers. They're probably one of my favorite families of birds. But this guy is rather loud, even at three in the morning. Mm-hmm. Some people like to sleep. Can see we're losing light it is going to be very difficult to find animals you're in this transition period where oh excuse the roof everyone that's not ideal we're in this transition period where it's not quite night time so you don't need a spotlight or headlights right now but it's also really getting a big sort of is providing a big challenge for... Oh, you got something! A 
I don't know what it is, but the kingfisher caught something. Completely threw me off on what I was saying, but that was very cool. We've just watched this kingfisher swoop down and hunt something. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, that is that sighting over. That was very cool. Well, I might have him, eh? Ah, you've still got him. Won't really be able to see the detail, oh. but it does look very artistic. Yeah. And he's not playing ball. No luck with the black dam male. It has been rainy and miserable all day, so he's either gone further into the thicket or moved off. But I was hoping by now, it is quarter to seven in the evening. I was hoping that I would hear him calling, but no luck. No luck. I do think we'll start to hear lions calling. There are a lot. Apparently there was a Talamati lioness in the Mulwanini, which is the adjacent river to the Mulwati. They both sort of run north to south. And that's one female Talamati there. We had a lion here, lions there. There are lots of lions around. It sort of does make sense why we're not seeing so many leopard action. This always happens when we get intense lion sightings, the leopards sort of disappear for a while. It's not safe for them to be around. Okay, we're gonna keep fumbling, see what else we can find. I'm gonna send you guys over to Nick and his wildebeest. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, still with the implausibility of wildebeest here. It looks like they may potentially even look to settle up here for the evening. You can see the herd in the back, they're looking quite comfortable there. So the sun has been trying to make an appearance. You can see in the background how it is catching those tall white squirrels, those long things that are standing up, just highlighting them a little bit. Unfortunately our wildebeest are still cast in a little bit of shadow here. But the sun is trying its best. Got to give it some brownie points for that. It is turning out to be a beautiful afternoon here. So the wind is dying down a little bit. Not that it's been puffing too hard. And if it does, does continue to, to clear, Lauren was mentioning that she'd, she was hoping that she might hear some lions calling by now. Our dominant male lions here at Kariha, they might belt out a roar for us tonight as well. Remember with all of this rain, they're going to need to tell everybody that they're still in charge here. And if you're with us during Escape to Nature, we did follow them for a little bit. So potentially we might hear a little bit of roaring coming from them as well. But that's uh, quite a distance from here. But you never know. I'm just going to take you out here. There's a beautiful patch of sunlight that's popped up now. Simon, thanks for your question. Not as far as I know. I haven't seen one or heard of any black wildebeest being here. Just our wildebeest. That, that is a road that you want to be driving right now. Look at that scenery in the back there. Lots of those euphorbia trees. And then I know all of you guys have looked carefully and you've actually spotted that rhino. Have a look at that. Just 
just on the right hand side of the road there there's a single rhino we've got some zebra in the front one two three four five giraffe look at that that is absolutely incredible looks like those two giraffe on the left might be kind of jostling a little bit dark mane lover uh, in terms of animals hanging around in the hills I'm not too sure if you're meaning in the thickets like behind these giraffes or at the tops of the hills so something like lions they would really enjoy the more sort of open areas right at the tops of the hills remember we talked about potentially hearing roaring and things like that from there they could project their roar and it would really travel Whereas the thickets that we can see behind these giraffe here, that would be really good for things like leopard. Remember they like more secretive dense areas, so that would be a great area for them. The Roman 100%, the heavens have opened up. We've got the landscape covered in a golden sheen here. Not quite everywhere, but in, in patches. You can kind of see it so slowly starting to transition across the, the open clearing here. But what a peaceful way to end off our afternoon here. Giraffe going about their business. You can see that rhino is just casually grazing there. Zebras doing a little bit of grazing as well And then it looks like those two giraffe are, are following each other around having a little domestic But temperature slowly starting to go down the sun starting to get a bit lower in the horizon And those are all good signs that potentially Cedric's lions might get up so let's hope and see and uh, have a look and see what they get up to Yes, Nick, you can uh, just uh, shift that sunshine over to Juma. I would be well appreciated for that because uh, it has been quite a cloudy day. We did have a little bit of sun. It wasn't so bad. We did have a little bit of sun, but uh, the sun has set now. There's still a lot of clouds around, and there's also a little bit of lightning that's uh, in the south from where we are now. So I think tonight we will have once again a good old thunder shower or thunderstorm. So hopefully during the drive it's going to stay away. I'll be very, very happy happy for that. But uh, yes, as you can see, it's now and again the one female is rolling over, kind of getting a little bit, how can I say, agitated with the flies. And uh, I'm hoping that they will need a bit of a drink very, very soon. I haven't heard any of the lions calling yet. I know that uh, Nick said he's hoping that he's going to hear those lions in Karika. But I'm sure Lauren and myself, we are going to be hanging around. And we will be listening out for any roars that will be coming through from these lions. And especially that uh, I think Lauren might be still around Trias Dam. Oh, that one is getting a little bit more awake. It's starting to groom itself. Oh, there you go. The, the yawn, a very big sign. A good sign and set up. Set up for us, please. No, she doesn't want to. She's like, no, I am lying down. I'm resting. But yeah, maybe Lauren might be around Trias Dam. I'm hoping she's still in that area because I'm sure those uh, black dam males will call tonight. It seems like they've been so, so vocal over the last month or so and uh, yeah I think she's gonna get up now for us and if they do come north and that's that, that's their general direction because they did come from the southern side of Juma and they did come straight to like a north north easterly direction so they might end up at our camp if they do come north like in a matter of 30 minutes 40 minutes you know once they start moving
Listen, lionesses, they've got the, pretty much like uh, a pride. So it's like a family group. That's a social structure. So it's all like the sisters and the aunties and the grannies, all part of the pride. But if they bump into another pride, they're not going to get on because prides, uh, female prides, have also got territories. They also pretty much have their set area. And that set area has always been marked as well by uh, um, spraying urine, also rubbing and scraping the back legs, as well as they do roar. So, but lions, female lions, uh, their roar is not as loud, not as uh, deep as a male, but uh, it is also that the noise does travel quite far. So they do have their, their set territory. If another female comes into the territory, or if another two, three females come into their territory, um, there will be a huge squabble. There will be definitely an altercation between the, the prides, and sometimes it could end up as a huge fight between those pride members. Um, so that's why, this, that's why these two females, they, <laughs> they are very much uh, testing times for them because if they bump into any pride, any females, <clears throat> excuse me, any females in this area, those females aren't going to tolerate them being here and they'll chase them. And especially being young females, sub-adult females, they are not going to stand their ground. They are going to run. And that's why they need each other. That's why the two of them, they need each other, especially when they're moving through these areas. There is another vehicle next to us. And, uh, yeah, the guy is busy singing a lullaby to himself. No, Jacqueline, I don't think. Look, eventually, when you're talking about eventually, maybe like, you know, if they take over this territory, then eventually it could be three, four, five years' time. It's the same as most of your coalitions. You looked at uh, Majingas, Majingalans, they moved to the west. Uh, look at the Birminghams, they moved down to the west, south, southwest. Uh, Matimbas, same thing. So eventually they get to that certain age where they don't want to control this area anymore. They've had enough and they'll move on. And that's when they get to a certain age where it's like about 10, 11 years old. And then they'll try and you know, go to the, like, I don't know why the west. No idea why. Every time it seems like the western side of the Sabi Sands is like the retirement area of uh, male line coalitions because every time they head into that direction. Even the Salatis, remember the Salati males? They used to be three, then it got it came, went down to two. They're the ones that killed uh, uh, Mr. T, one of the Mapoho males. So, yeah, and those have moved down to the west. It's weird. Strange. Maybe it's like a void. Oh, sorry, I wasn't even looking. I was looking into the distance. So you can see she's picked up on the noise. You can see definitely how alert she is. She's just listening straight south from where they're lying. Maybe, a, oh, there's a jackal in front of us. There's a blackback jackal. Can you believe it? It is a blackback jackal. Yeah, it is. Look at that. A blackback <laughs> Busy riding a bicycle. <laughs> but yeah, oh, I see a blackback jackal coming for us. I haven't seen a blackback jackal for so, so long. Look at that. Oh my word. That is amazing, just like that. A blackback jackal has entered our, our shot. You can see even this uh, the one lioness is like, hmm, what are you doing here? But it's typical. I've seen it quite a few times. You find lions walking, and you find a you find a blackback jackal just trailing. But yeah, we are going to go in infrared now, so we will have a change in color. So we are going to put the infrared on. There it is. So yeah, so we do not use any spotlights or car lights. Net. We've got just the infrared light, so we keep the lions in their natural. How can I say? Lighting, darkness, ways. When was the last time you caught your breath? 
When were you last truly amazed? When last did you marvel at the wonder of nature? Wild Earth Epic Animal Encounters Only available on the Wild Earth app. Look at the view we have right now. Isn't it so stormy and ominous and oof? I think we're in store for a lot of rain tonight. But it's also very abstract and very beautiful to look at this view with the dead tree and the clouds just tumbling behind it. It's obviously getting dark now. But I do just want to say good evening to any of you that have just joined us on our live safari, our live and interactive safari. It is in fact our sunset safari, but the sun has set. Was it ever out today? Not really. But my name is Lauren Davi, is on camera, and we are coming to you live from Juma Private Game Reserve and the Sabi Sand. And we have had a wonderful afternoon looking at very random things, including birds hunting, terrapin, termites, it really just has been a wonderful afternoon, especially since it rained all day. All the creatures are coming out. On the other vehicle in Juma, we have Cedric, who has spent most of his afternoon with lions. In Medikwe, Ben had wild dogs earlier on, and then he spent a long time with an elephant herd. And Nick in Karika has had giraffe and zebra. So it really has been a wonderful afternoon. We are coming to the end of our Sunset Bumble, but please don't forget, you can absolutely talk to us. You can send in your questions, your comments, and anything that you wish to discuss. Andrea, you're saying it's a picturesque view and it's very captivating. It is. It looks like a painting. It was actually Davi's idea to stop here and take a look. Oh, yeah. Just because this is a nice open area that's slightly raised and you get really good views from this open area and it just looks so dramatic. You can see a vehicle off in the distance. That's how high up we are. 
Obviously, we are losing light. But it provides quite a nice black, white, and grey image. We do have half an hour left of our sunset bumble, and I think it is going to be worth me just hoping to get some nocturnal activity. The predators will be waking up, that's for sure. I didn't hear any lion calls at our side, which is a little bit disappointing. Okay, I've got my spotlight out and I think we should bumble. Are you ready, Dobby? Let's go. Talking of predators getting up, I believe Cedric's lions are finally on the move. Yes, Lauren, I agree. This storm is rolling in. There is a huge storm coming ahead of us, and I think uh, I won't be surprised. I'm sure Lauren is uh, really much closer to camp than uh, we are. So. Um, yeah, I'm just keeping an eye. I think it won't be long before it is going to bucket down with uh, with rain. There's a bit of lightning as well, so yeah, I'm just going to keep an eye on it while we sit with these two beautiful lionesses. <clears throat> so I think in a night like this, I haven't heard a single predator call. I haven't heard a lion call. I haven't heard leopards call. I was hoping to hear that uh, black-backed jackal that we had running past us. That was fantastic to see. I was hoping to hear that call because I haven't heard a black-backed jackal call for such a long time. And they've got the most beautiful call. I love it. I think it's like the most airy African call that we can get is a black-backed jackal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I did not mean to startle the the, the, the lionesses. Whoops. Sorry. Did not mean to do that. Did I do it so well that it actually kind of got their heads up? <laughs> oh no. It was funny enough. It was like with Panda as well not long ago, and I was just doing a showing how uh, wild dogs. Uh, whoop and all that and uh, all of a sudden we had these wild dogs come running towards our vehicle <laughs> sorry girls anyway but yeah that's how uh, black back call, uh, black back jackal calls but it, it's difficult to say I mean it's just it depends on Look, the thing is, there is a lot of uh, competition uh, uh, around here when it comes to uh, predators. And I mean, whew, the, the Juma clan and the hyena uh, numbers here in this area is quite high. And sometimes, yes, that could be a, a huge case where, of course, all of a sudden you'll find the jackals, the side stripe, the black back jackals feel that, uh, you know, it's pointless hanging around here when they're not going to really uh, you know, get much. But um, you'll find that the... Uh, side stripe jackal took over from the black pack jackals that happened i remember in 2010 2011 there in Koro Chita plains we used to have so many black pack jackals that side and every night you'd hear them and all of a sudden the side stripe jackals would come in or they came in and uh, the black pack jackals uh, just the population just disappeared um well the side stripe is larger than the black pack i think about two kilograms i think the side stripe is like 13 kgs and black pack is about 11 and yeah, but yeah, tumors, you know, maybe we do see them now and again, but it's very far and few. So, and I mean, also your leopard population is, you know, it's quite, it's quite decent in this area. But I think the hyenas is the big issue with the, uh, with the jackals around here. So I'm just looking at, there is, the lightning is, uh, it's coming very close. Just keeping an eye on this one, yeah. 
<laughs> we are gonna get soaked. I can see it. I'm just preparing myself mentally. That's all right. I can do it. <laughs> and I think these two lionesses are not going to move much. I think with this kind of rain, 10 to 1, they might actually go and find a little bit of cover in those quarry bushes. It's just, uh, to the, to, you know, just next to them. I think they might just end up finding cover, especially if it's going to be this hard rain. It's very hard rain, and they're not going to do. They're not going to move. I think that's why we're not even hearing any lions calling for now. Because it is now pitch dark. Definitely, the frogs are out. The frogs are out in numbers. I mean, you loads of frogs at them. You hear those banded rubber frogs. You hear the leaf folding frogs little grass frogs as well it really is darkness now and it really is time to drive very, very slowly. Listen as much as you can. It's quite tricky sometimes when the engine's going and you're multitasking, but listen, look, tune into all your senses actually and drive slowly. This is when you'll find your nocturnals and I don't just mean your predators. I mean owls, white-tailed mongoose, porcupines, civet, genet, moths, anything that really comes out in the night. It's also a really good time to spot chameleons. They are not nocturnal though, but it's a good time to spot them. got a insect down my top. Wonderful. <laughs> Get out. Sorry about that. It would be nice to end it off with a last minute leopard, that's for sure. My leopard luck has not been too great this time around. I would thoroughly enjoy bumping into one tonight. The rain changes everything out here. It just becomes so wet. Animals just change their behavior slightly when there's this much water. It's always a bit of a struggle. going to keep bumbling in the dark and hopefully we get lucky with some nocturnal animals. Oh, the one lioness has uh, just moved into the thickets now. I don't know, she did, I think she looked like she was interested in something more than actually going to take a, a lie down there, but it looks like she went Away, oh, here comes the other females also picking up on something. Let's just see where they're gonna go. Um, do do do. See, now the thing is, if I move, I'm not too sh Oh, 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 that was hippos. Those lions growling there. All right, let's go take a look. Sorry, I'm gonna quickly turn here. Sorry, that something happened there. I heard growling. Okay, let's keep turning around. Sorry, uh, let's go. I, I'm sure we'll be fine. You're right there. I can't see a thing there. I don't know. Just, I'm just going to go around. There is another road. I just want to see if we can pick it up on the on the cut line. 
Oh, definitely the growling ones. I want to see if I can see them. I want to lose them. It's gone. Huh? I think maybe another lioness approached them. Because that was funny. That was that big old. Good afternoon, everyone. We will just let Cedric settle and find those lions. But we are just keeping our eyes on the Duma Dam Cam, of course. Seeing if anyone comes around. However, it might be a little bit tricky. This dam is so full right now. The actual inflow is really, really thriving, which is wonderful for Mother Nature, wonderful for the animals. But let's be honest, it is not ideal for us. <laughs> a lot of the areas where our leopards used to come through, a lot of our other animals is now filled with water. But just a short while ago, we did have some elephants. Not a big herd, probably about five to seven individuals, but there was a tiny elephant with them. Which of course was adorable, but it was a brief sighting. They only came for a quick sip and then left again. So we are just keeping our eyes peeled, checking for any nocturnal animals. Like Lauren said, that does not just mean leopards and lions and hyenas, that can really be anything. From bush babies to scrub hares to civets, genets all sorts of creatures alrighty I'm gonna send you back to Cedric so we can keep updated with those cats We might have heard something else, but as you can see, that the one lioness has turned into a impala. No, I'm just joking. Uh, those, uh, those lionesses are actually stalking these impala. So they, when they went into that bush, they saw and heard these impala. That's about maybe 10 meters from them. So, so close to them. So, of course, we've got infrared, so we're not spotlighting anything. We're not giving any animal the advantage or disadvantage. So um, we're just going to... Keep our eyes on these impalas as those lionesses are just inside of the thickets, just behind them. So I think it wasn't growling. I think what we heard was maybe it might have been my stomach that was growling for dinner, or it could have been these hippos that make those funny noises sometimes here in Bobab Dam. Because if it was lions growling and fighting or, you know, growling at each other, those impalas will not be there. They would have run long time ago. Yeah, I don't think they caught anything at this point of time. I think as we got around the corner, they're not far from them. It's just very difficult to see exactly. I'm just going to hopefully see what plays out here. So the lines are just to the left and the impalas are just practically in the center of the frame of the picture. So I'm just going to put, I'll make sure I'm not getting surprised by something next to me here. And this, well, I can see that a little bit jittery, a little bit jittery, but they haven't alarmed called or anything. This is a perfect opportunity for them because it's dark, there's no light, nothing. It's pitch, pitch dark. So this is definitely plays in the lion's uh, advantage. Was it got that? Does that impala look like it's limping in the middle there? I keep on thinking impala's limping when it moves. It looks like 
No, it's not, sorry. Maybe it's just, just tripped over a branch here. Oh, you can see they're quite jittery. Maybe a, a good old successful hunt for these two young girls. It'll be very nice for them. I'm not too sure how far they are now. <laughs> Why, Keisha? Yes, boom shakalaka. Definitely so nice to see these two girls. And uh, I'm hoping that they're going to be successful tonight with this hunt. It'll be fantastic for them. Um, you know, and uh, uh, get a little bit of. Well, already, their bellies are already full. So they've already been successful last night. So, yeah, clearly cats will be cats. We're opportunistic. If the opportunity is there, why not? I know that these impalas are so close. I think these lions are in the center. There's a bush at the back, and I'm sure they're, they're right behind that bush, but it's difficult to see. You see the one with the leaves that's pretty much swaying on top. They're right behind there. So that's that definitely this. I can use this darkness and have a good old, I can say, an element of surprise for those impalas. But yeah, cats can also have a lot of patience. They've taught me to have patience. I mean, leopards and lions. When it comes to hunting, they can take their time and just the right opportunity and the right timing. You can see the, the lightning and the weather in the background now and again. You can see the light, the sky lighting up. <laughs> Maria, I'm glad that you say it's better than any action movie. Definitely. It's uh, it's wild earth, it's wildlife, it's live, it's a live safari. Definitely. You never know what's going to happen. Sometimes action movies, you know what's going to happen. But these live safaris, it's uh, anything is possible. Anything. And that's why it's always this like waiting and anticipation, you know, and like for us here now as well. I mean, Panda, myself, my eyes set on the screen. I'm like, come on. And then if something does happen, it's just going to be like this burst of like light coming out and chasing this impala. So if that does happen, it's going to be very quick and it's going to happen suddenly. Yeah, like we just now that maybe the lions might even be circling them. I'm just looking behind me. Just now they came. Maybe these lions came behind me. Yeah, but no, there's nothing yet. Yeah. Oh, double check. Oh, let's see if those impalas didn't move away. Yeah, the lightning is coming a little bit closer. Huh? Yeah, this weather is pulling in very quickly. And you can see that little bit of that breeze that's coming through now as well. And just we have to keep our eyes peeled for that. Fortunately, we've got an antenna at the back of the vehicle. It almost acts like a, con a lightning conductor. So, yeah, we just got to play it very safe here.
I don't know where these lines are. They, they're in that thicket. No, I've got no clue. I think uh, let's, uh, we need to maybe move a little bit into another position and we can just take a look. All right, well, we're going to try and just see if we can pick up uh, one more sighting of these uh, lionesses. But uh, while we do that, let's head over to Lauren as she has found a... Well, she's found something for you, definitely, something exciting, always. We have found the coolest thing, but we didn't stop to show you, we actually stopped to let you listen. Of course, we're looking at a frog, not entirely sure what species right now, because we're looking through infrared. But I just want you to sit and listen to the incredible sounds. Josie, I can actually hardly hear my director right now. That's how loud it is. I'm glad to hear you're enjoying the sounds, Josie. I'm just going to let you listen. I'm sure you know all about frogs. I'm going to immerse yourself in this moment. I'm not even sure what my director is telling me right now. I'm really glad you enjoyed this moment here with all the sounds of summer. We're going to head home for dinner and we are going to send you over to another naturalist to close the show. Thanks, Lauren. You are definitely a beautiful sunset here. Amazing colors in the sky, some thin wispy clouds close to the top of the frame here. And just a very peaceful and tranquil end to the day. With all of the rain that we've had here as well, some of our frogs are quite excited. I heard a few bubbling casinos calling. And remember, it's this time of the day, right just before it starts to, to get dark, that our black-backed jackals start calling. And I've been hearing about four or five of them, literally in the last minute, minute and a half. And I've been scanning all over the place, having a look. But it's definitely quite tricky to be able to spot them in, in this light, now that it's fading. 
Remember on top of their back they've obviously got that sort of blackish darkish color like their name suggests and if they're standing still and they're quite far away it's not easy to spot but there's not a breath of wind now it's been amazing to watch the the color in the sky slowly fading as well you know we talked earlier about the the sky hopefully parting and it did part for us beautifully we had a vibrant saturated sunset bright oranges and reddish colors and that has given way to these pinker tones And you can see how that is even starting to fade. The top of the frame now has lost most of its color already. But it's been another amazing afternoon here in the Eastern Cape at Kariga Game Reserve. And I hope all of you have enjoyed the afternoon with us from our various locations. It's always nice to spend a little bit of time in the bush and hopefully we've brought a little bit of the bush to your home. Look at that, it's slowly transitioning so it almost looks like a black and white picture now. It's absolutely amazing how quickly it changes. Nature never ceases to amaze. But thanks for joining us, everybody, and we will see you tomorrow.